Is it, is it working? Okay. Okay, let's get started. This seems working, but we don't need to watch it here. Okay, let me fix this too. Okay, is everyone ready? We can get started. So we've been covering memory controllers for a couple of lectures now, and this is going to be the last lecture. Although we're always going to touch on memory controllers later on when we talk about emerging memory technologies. But what I want to do first is to do a quick wrap up of what we did not cover and what we will not cover in memory controllers and quality of service. This is a huge area, clearly. There's been a lot of work that was done over the course of 15 years or so. And things are improving, as I said, in real systems also, but there's more to be done, in my opinion. I'll give you a glimpse of what more could be done. You already know that using machine learning techniques to actually manage these resources could be a very good way actually going into the future. There's more work to be done in that area. But let's, uh, let's continue and maybe you'll ask questions also. Okay, so some of these are actually reminder slides. As you remember, we're talking about how to build quality of service aware systems. And there are three key questions. How do you reduce interference between the things that we're trying to quality of, uh, provide different types of quality of service for? How do we control the interference? And how do we make the system more configurable, flexible, so that we can uh, enable different kinds of uh, quality of service policies? We don't want to bake in some specific policy to hardware, for example, because clearly in in the software domain and the system usage domain, things change, right? Uh, the single policy is not sufficient, basically. And remember, we were cl we classified uh, approaches to quality of service into two ways, basically. One is keep the component of our designs, but make them smarter. Uh, basically, make, oh, sorry, make the component of our designs smarter. These are smart resources. And the second is keep the component of our designs as they are, mostly, and manage the quality of service and interference outside using some techniques like source throttling, mapping, and thread scheduling. And we were mainly focusing on prioritization or request scheduling, focusing on the memory controllers, right? And I mentioned that there are other techniques. I, I'm gonna show this again, but if you want to learn more about other techniques, you'll have to look at the other lectures. And we covered this load latency curve yesterday, which is actually critical uh, in performance analysis. Okay, and memory channel partitioning, we will not cover. So let's go into quality of service of our memory scheduling. Again, I'm going to flash the slide. Some of these slides actually may make more sense right now because we've talked about uh, these three schedulers, like Stall Time Fairware, Parallelism Aware, and Atlas. We've talked about threat cluster memory scheduling. I'm going to pick up on that. And then we may cover a few more. But again, these slides are for your benefit as a summary. So this is what we talked about, basically. How do you provide stall time fairness? How do you actually preserve intra-thread bank level parallelism? Uh, this is a parallelism over batch scheduling. And this introduces two concepts that are very interesting, parallelism awareness and batch scheduling. And you can read the papers. We talked about Atlas. You implemented Atlas, actually. Uh, and you also implemented Bliss, which we're going to talk about. Okay, let me, uh, this is almost where we uh, left off. We did introduce thread cluster memory scheduling. Basically, the realization here is that uh, one type of policy for all threads is not good enough, basically. Some threads uh, are not hurting others. These are the little mice over there. They're not hurting the other threads. As a result, if you want high throughput, prioritize them because they don't generate memory requests to memory. And once you prioritize their requests, they go back and keep their cores busy, basically. That's good for system throughput, clearly. But the realization is that for fairness, you need to do something different because fairness problems usually happen because you uh, prioritize some big threads over each other, elephants, as we discussed yesterday, right? And to ensure that no one gets deprioritized for a long time, shuffle the thread ranking among them uh, so that uh, you minimize the uh, unfairness issues. This also improves system performance actually by enabling more proportional progress of these threads. Uh, but fairness is the main goal of the design decision over here. Uh, okay. Okay, we discussed how this works. You group threads into clusters and prioritize non-intensive one and do different policies inside each of the clusters because they, uh, they, they have different needs. You can think of these as latency sensitive versus bandwidth sensitive threads also, right? If you think about them, uh, the threads that don't generate a lot of requests to memory with some uh, stretch of imagination 
you can think of them as latency sensitive. Meaning, why are they latency sensitive? Because they have one request, they're waiting for memory, and if you service them, they'll go back and keep their cores busy happily, right? In a sense, they're limited by the latency of memory, how, how long uh, you take to service that one request that happens once in a while. Whereas these other threads that are in the intensive cluster are more bandwidth sensitive, they keep generating a lot of requests to memory. As a result, it's all about, well, not all, but it's mainly about how much bandwidth you provide to them. And if you provide one, a lot more bandwidth than the others for a long period of time, uh, what might happen is actually uh, you can delay uh, the other ones that are also bandwidth sensitive. So you need to be careful in terms of how do you actually provide bandwidth to these different threads. That's the idea. We didn't call them late, late sensitive and bandwidth sensitive. We call them non-intensive and intensive, but you can think of them as that way also. Okay. So, okay, we talked about quantum-based operation. Basically, in a quantum, you monitor the thread behavior. Uh, you uh, basically collect characteristics about different threads, as we discussed. Memory intensity, misses per kilo, instruction, bank load, parallelism, and buffer locality. And at the beginning of quantum, you perform clustering and you compute the niceness of the threads so that they can aid your ranking. I didn't talk about the details of how you do the ranking, uh, the shuffling of the ranking also, but you can read the paper for more. Okay, and in the end, it boils down to prioritization, basically. You compute all of that, and you assign a value, a priority value to requests, right? Each request is a priority value based on the rank of the thread it belongs to. So a request from higher rank threads gets prioritized, and this is... You can write it this way, non-intensive cluster gets prioritized over intensive. Within the non-intensive cluster, lower intensity threads get higher rank. And within the intensive cluster, ranking changes based on some shuffling algorithm that happens dynamically during the quantum, right? So based on this information, you can assign a single priority value to each request, right? Because in the end, request scheduling is all about the prioritization of requests. And then there's another priority level based on row hit status, as you can see. We still want to exploit robo for locality. And then the oldest first. These are the FRFCFS priority levels that we've been used to. Right? And if you implement it like this, uh, it's actually not that high cost, but the complexity may be high, right? This is just looking at the storage cost. But there's also uh, parts that you need to deal with, like how do you cluster threads, right? There's, so there's clustering computation that you need to do that's not taken into account over here. This is mainly for memory scheduling over here. But then you need to have some metadata for clustering and some logic for clustering, et cetera. So that, those all add to the uh, picture, let's say. And you can make no computation on the critical path, but uh, it's not easy to design, let's say. Okay, yeah, and this is the picture that I showed you last time. I'm, I'm ignoring the slide because this basically covers uh, what are the prior works we're comparing to, and you know all of these works actually. And you can, you can also analyze what they're not good at as we did. Okay, and then uh, basically we, our goal was to achieve the best of both worlds in terms of fairness and throughput. And then the workloads we examined, uh, thread cluster memory scheduling essentially does that. Basically it moves the Pareto frontier over here. Uh, and if you do something like this in these workloads, clearly none of these prior schedulers become good on average, right? For specific workloads, different schedulers may be better, right? Clearly. And that's always a problem, right? There's no scheduler that's good for every single workload that you construct or imagine basically. Uh, some workloads, basically, Atlas works great, for example, right? Okay, and that's something to consider, right? Uh, th th this is essentially, I think, why I believe uh, some more learning-based controllers can be better because these controllers, okay, one of them may be better than the other on average, if, if you, especially if you tune it. But uh, uh, you, you will always find some fraction of workloads that are not good for a given algorithm. And different algorithms are actually quite good for different workloads. And maybe, uh, maybe if you learn somehow over time, you can des design a better policy that uh, outperforms everything by learning over time. Right? That's the reason I like actually that, that machine learning approach. It's not because I just love machine learning and just want to apply it to computer architecture, right? That's not the goal. The goal is there's a reason why I believe it could be beneficial in this case, because these heuristics are just human designed. Everything is human designed and you've seen all of those designs. And I believe they're actually quite creative they're new, they bring new value to the field, but they just don't work for every workload that you see, right? And also the, tuning them is also not easy, actually. If you, uh, even though the papers may make it sound easy in, in real systems, you tune it for some workload. Okay, 96 workloads, they're tuned, let's say. But what about uh, the remaining 1 million workloads out there? Right? In the end, you don't know necessarily. 
when you when uh, when when someone runs your uh, system and figures out that they don't get as good performance, they will figure it out. Right? But a learning based mechanism can potentially do better. But of course, that's also an area of research, as we discussed. Now, uh, TCM also enables some nice things to the operating system. And I, I think actually uh, one, uh, you mentioned yesterday that uh, there are synergies between this and the operating system scheduling mechanisms. And actually that's true. And there are more synergies than what you discussed also. I will discuss what you discussed later on when we talk about upsides. But there are some other things that you can do. For example, when you, config, when you vary the configuration parameter of different schedulers, you get some odd behavior. Like what is the configuration parameter for FRFCFS? How many requests can be reordered beyond the oldest requests, right? That's one configuration parameter. Uh, STFM has another configuration parameter, which is the alpha, maximum tolerable unfairness. Power BS is a marking cap. And Atlas has some quantum length in this particular case. And if you vary them, you get this not so nice behavior, let's say, right? Uh, but if you vary TCM within reasonable bounds, let's say, this is the clustering threshold, you get a nice fairness throughput trade-off, at least in these workloads that we examined, 96 of them. So these, all of these points are actually quite, let's say, pretty optimal, right? Uh, basically, you can pick any of these depending on what your goal is. Right? If you want to uh, maximize, uh, let's say, uh, uh, through, uh, throughput, uh, sorry, fairness, you want lower, uh, higher, uh, lower maximum slowdown, this point is quite good, right? If you want to maximize performance, this point is quite good. And it's better than any other point, as you can see uh, in Atlas. So there, uh, there, it's, a, it's a nice trade-off you can see over here by adjusting cluster threshold. Of course, it may not be as robust for all workloads, right? These are the workloads that it's tuned for. Okay, uh, that's part of the operating system support base. The operating system can somehow pick between fairness and throughput in that curve. And also we have support for enforcing thread weights. We discussed this briefly for STFM, if you remember. You can, uh, the operating system can assign weights to threads based on the importance of different threads. And threads cluster memory scheduling enforces thread weights uh, with each cluster, uh, within each cluster. You can basically say in each cluster, okay, I have these uh, bandwidth sensitive threads, but one of them is extremely important to the user. When I'm doing my shuffling, I will bias my shuffling toward this important thread for the user, such that it gets more bandwidth from the memory system. And depending on how much the weight is, you get more uh, proportional bandwidth to your weight. So it's actually relatively easy to reason about, let's say. And that's true for the latency sensitive cluster. So if you're in the latency sensitive cluster and one thread is more important than the other thread in the latency sensitive cluster, you prioritize that thread inside the latency sensitive cluster. What we don't do is enforce thread weights across latency sensitive and bandwidth sensitive clusters, because if you do the clustering right, the latency sensitive threads should not cause problems to potentially higher weight threads in the bandwidth sensitive cluster. But you can also imagine doing that, right? If, if a thread is so high priority, the user can actually support that. So I think these interactions are actually quite interesting, basically. Now we are talking about system software and uh, memory controller co-design, right? Memory controller can get information from the system software and it can actually be, uh, let's say, uh, it can actually satisfy users' wishes. Today, that's not done, right? Well, mostly not done, let's say. Today, uh, hardware components, uh, they don't really enforce threat priorities very well. And sometimes when they enforce, it's usually very crude. I think Intel, for example, provided some uh, additions where you can prioritize high intensity threads, but this sort of weight support uh, is not uh, there yet, let's say. Okay, so that's the conclusion of thread cluster memory scheduling. Yes, please. Yeah, so um, yesterday you mentioned that because of the lack of, I guess, the ability for the user to assign importance to threads, what they usually do for um, certain really important processes is just dedicate hardware to them. Uh -huh. And so, like, I guess, like, and you mentioned the example of the airplane and the autonomous car, and I guess in the way in the car that's done is they have um, separate electronic control un units, which have like their own compute, I guess, for all uh -huh. the different sensors and stuff. So I was wondering if you, um, I guess, just, just for the motivation for um, developing um, you know, like the, the QoS um, capable um, systems, um, which with us be able to centralize compute and reduce costs. Do you know like, how much of approximately costs that could save maybe in the case yeah. of cars or airplanes? And the cars and airplanes. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's not, <laughs> it's, I mean, I didn't do the calculations myself, but the expectation is that they would save costs. Uh, I mean, there, there are multiple goals actually. Uh, it's it's cost uh, plus efficiency because all of these components are drawing different power, right? If, you're, if you have many chips, usually 
What the LSI a very large scale integration has enabled us is actually putting things together. As a result, you're more power efficient as well, as opposed to having many chips. So there's power efficiency you save, uh, especially if you're running on batteries, that's important actually. Uh, and then uh, uh, there's the other aspect of reliability. If you have many components, uh, it's likely that you're less reliable because the failure rate of many chips is likely to be higher than a single chip, right? That's what studies have shown in the past because there are many, many links, for example, can fail, right? Whereas you have, your on-chip interconnects are usually more reliable compared to off-chip links that are exposed to high temperatures, low temperatures, environmental conditions, right? So there are many benefits that are a bit harder to quantify uh, of consolidation. So I don't know a direct answer to your question. How much do you exactly save? I don't know, but the expectation is that if you can consolidate, uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you, can, you can save and gain benefit in multiple dimensions, not just cost. Wait, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but of course it comes with quality of service and you need to ensure that things run uh, well. Okay, so I'm not gonna repeat this basically. I think the takeaway is uh, using a single policy for all threads is not sufficient uh, for a memory scheduling. And uh, you can get the best of both worlds, let's say system throughput and fairness, at least for the workloads that we studied uh, with thread cluster memory scheduling. But of course, this is not perfect, right? This, like any idea we, just, uh, we study, any idea out there, let's say, I will, uh, over, I will claim, but I don't think this is an overclaim, any idea out there, if you critically analyze it, it has upsides and downsides. Nothing is perfect, let's say. So TCM is clearly, as we discussed, it provides the best of both worlds. It caters to the needs of different types of threads. So this is uh, perhaps the first scheduling policy that does it in a very explicit way. Latency versus bandwidth sensitive, as we discussed, intensive versus non-intensive. And it's conceptually simple and intuitive, but the implementation may not be as simple, right? It has a lot of moving parts, clustering, uh, data collection, shuffling, etc. In fact, the paper goes into a lot of detail about how to shuffle these threads. I don't think you need a lot of complexity, but you can do random shuffling also potentially, but that doesn't work as well as, let's say more vulnerability or niceness uh, driven shuffling. And I think uh, this is important. Uh, integration with the operating system thread prioritization policies can be easy as we discussed yesterday, right? Operating systems usually have interactive threads versus let's say non-interactive threads. And uh, they group the threads also into different categories and uh, they prioritize those threads differently. Like interactive threads are uh, assumed to be more latency sensitive, so they're prioritized more. They're, they're scheduled more often. They're, uh, they're given more time, let's say. Uh, but, uh, but those priorities, if, if, you, if you look at that operating system scheduling, uh, if you schedule many applications, interactive, non-interactive, at the same time uh, on a multi-core system, those priorities have no meaning for the hardware, right? And this is the disconnect between an operating system and hardware today. Operating system may, be, may, may know the uh, different characteristics of the threads, but they don't get communicated to the hardware. And the hardware also doesn't have any mechanism to actually take advantage of that information, if, if they get, even if they get communicated. So hardware kind of assumes all threads are equal. It schedules requests using FRFCFS. Okay, okay, I'm picking a bad baseline, basically fine. But basically uh, there's a huge disconnect between operating system and uh, the hardware. I think thread cluster memory scheduling kind of gets much closer to the operating system policies. You have the operating system. Okay, potentially the operating system can dictate which threads go to which categories, right? You can imagine that. That simplifies clearly the design of the hardware in this case. We didn't do that, but this sort of idea, clustering threads and treating them differently in the memory scheduler uh, can also make you think that somebody else gives this information and that could be the operating system, right? If, if they know enough about threads, they can, they can provide that information. And I think that's a very good uh, direction of future work. How do we actually enable uh, more seamless uh, operating system policies uh, uh, to be enforced in hardware? And TCM is a step in the right direction, in my opinion. Okay, but of course it has downsides. Like we've, uh, because of its complexity, let's say, if, you, if your buffer size increase, what happens? If you have thousands of requests, how do you do the, if you have thousands of uh, requests and threads, I should also say threads over here, large buffer size as well as threads. How do you do the clustering? The complexity basically increases with the number of threads. We discussed it yesterday also a bit. How robust are the clustering and shuffling algorithms? And again, uh, it's difficult to make them robust because there are a lot of thresholds. I think of this as a lot of moving parts basically. It's not as simple of an algorithm like Atlas, for example. Right? 
Uh, and ranking is still too complex, and uh, we'll, we're going to discuss that basically. Uh, and that is true, actually. And uh, also, uh, after designing policies, we, policies, we start we start the question: Do you really need full ranking in the threads? Basically, does every thread ha need to have some sort of ranking assigned to it? Maybe you can group them in some different ways. And that's pushed us toward thinking much more simple ways, which actually buy good performance also, as we will see. Any other? Yes. So mention, mentioning the operating system, I'm thinking that um, just what if uh, let the memory scheduler just do some statistic and then export the information to the operating system and then let the operating system to do the scheduling. Mm -hmm. Is that a good idea? Because I think, um, the operating system already have many stuff about the scheduling, mm -hmm. but to calculate, for example, to calculate the number of memory requests, maybe too much overhead for the software. Yeah. So yeah. It, uh, is that, how do you think about this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that sort of information passed back from the memory controller to the operating system could be very useful uh, as well. Like we're not gonna cover it, but memory channel partitioning works that way, for example. Uh, memory channel partitioning, the operating system partitions the memory channel like those applications, but the hardware provides the information, like fine grained information that's needed for the operating system to be aware of, like how many requests each thread is generating. So I think that's also a very good direction. Can we feed back some information from the hardware to the operating system such that the operating system can change its policies and thread prioritization policies? Yeah. Okay. Okay, and that's the paper, and you can take a look at it. That's one of the papers you can re read and review, and that's a shorter version of it. Now, this brings me to uh, Bliss, uh, which is probably the last one I'm going to describe, although that's probably a lie because I have one more uh, that I have in mind. So, okay, uh, some of the complexity that's introduced by these controllers uh, wanted, uh, uh, like triggered us to think about uh, memory scheduling a little bit more simply also going into the future. Uh, and Basically, you know about application aware memory scheduling. If you think about it, prior works basically monitor the applications, they rank them somehow, and then enforce the ranks. So both of this ranking and enforcing the ranks actually can be costly in terms of hardware, right? Unless someone provides this information, of course, right? Like the operating system, but we didn't discuss that over here. We're looking at purely dynamic hardware handling the ranking as well as enforcing the ranks. Clearly enforcing the ranks can be also complex, but you can probably Try to simplify it. It's basically a priority encoder, right? You, you, you have a prioritization mechanism. You look at the priority value and you find the highest priority uh, application uh, requests. And then you find the highest priority request between, uh, among them based on the priority. Uh, you, you can play a lot of hardware tricks to make that uh, hardware as simple and as fast as possible. But again, maybe with a small request queue, it doesn't matter as much. But if your request queues become larger and larger, hundreds, thousands, et cetera, this becomes a, a much bigger, let's say, content addressable memory. So basically full ranking of applications increases critical path latency and area. Uh, and the goal is to improve performance and fairness clearly as we have seen, right? But maybe there's another dimension to the problem that should be explicitly considered and that's simplicity in this case. And if you look at uh, the ideal, ideally you would like the, all of these to be maximized, right? Performance, fairness, and simplicity. But let's take a look at how different uh, schedulers fare. I'm not putting numbers over here. Again, this is like an industry presentation, but there are actually numbers associated with all of these metrics, clearly. You can read in the paper. If I put numbers over here, it'll be kind of uh, intractable to see, let's say. But this is an application unaware policy. So it's, you can see that performance and fairness are not good, but it's very, very simple. Okay. If you look at application aware policies, at least some of them that we have discussed, they look like this. They're good at performance and fairness, usually. Again, this is average across some number of applications, but they, come, they fall short on simplicity, right? So they're complex. All of them are complex, basically. And then the question is, is it essential to give up simplicity to optimize for performance and or fairness? So we wanted to develop a very simple policy without, uh, let's say, hurting performance and fairness much compared to application-aware policies. And that's the idea of, uh, bliss, which you have implemented, which you probably know very well, so I'm not going to go into all our detail. But basically, that was the motivation for bliss to enable uh, simplicity. Maybe you give out a little bit of simplicity compared to the best. Maybe you give up a little bit of fairness, but it turns out this is actually quite high performance because 
sometimes it's not easy to explain some of these high performance reasons uh, because uh, you, you schedule requests and there are long-term consequences, but simplicity helps performance also. I will actually explain because ranking, full ranking sometimes first performs also, right? Because you have a full ranking that you need to obey, you have a lot of threads. Does it really make sense to, how do you decide which thread should be ranked over another for some time, right? Those threads may be very equal to each other. Does it really make sense to rank one thread over another for just very simple, uh, because they're different in some metrics in a very, very small way, right? And that hurts performance and fairness sometimes actually, because you're, you're trying to enforce this ranking just because your scheduler works in a ranking based manner, but it's, it really doesn't make sense. Uh, you cannot really explain the reason why you have that ranking. Right? Imagine you have 24 threads, 10 of them are very similar to each other, just because they're a little bit different in terms of their attain service in Atlas, or in terms of their uh, misses per instruction in, uh, in, in uh, TCM, you have a full ranking among them. Right? So that's the reason why uh, I think some of these full ranking uh, systems don't make sense because it's very hard to re reason about why you're doing this ranking, right? And I think that's, my, uh, that's the biggest intuition in bliss in my opinion. You don't need to do ranking unless you really have to do ranking, let's say, yes. Isn't the reason why I want to do ranking is um, so that things within a given, so that yes. there's high locality and thus you get bank level parallel. Um, yes, parallel yes, validation. yes. Basically, there is a good reason. You're right. <laughs> so that's one reason. Sure. Yes. And that's something Bliss doesn't exploit very well. Absolutely. So that's basically the, uh, uh, to exploit bank level parallelism, I think ranking helps. Uh, but I think I have a counter argument to that also, because it's, let's assume that you have 24 threads and all of them are generating memory requests. Your bank level parallelism exploitation in the, uh, in the, in the fastest threads, uh, let's say that threads that are actually highly ranked is perfect, close to perfect. But as you go higher and higher in the rank order, your bank level parallelism is kind of messed up to begin with anyway. It's dependent on who else got prioritized before you. Does that make sense? If you think of this Tetris, right? Uh, depending on the, uh, amount of requests that are in your different banks and the uh, load balance across your different banks, uh, the ones that benefit the most from uh, exploiting the bank level parallelism is the thre are the threads that are ranked the highest usually. Yes. And um, so if this really achieves good performance and fairness and it is the simplest of these um, mechanisms, how does it come that it was invented last? It seems somehow counterintuitive. How, how does what? How does it come it was invented last of? Well, uh, I think that's, uh, it's, a, it's a thought process, right? Science works with <laughs> thought processes. There were, there were good reasons why uh, these, uh, uh, these other works were invented. And then you come to a realization that, okay, maybe we push too far in the complexity space. That's why, that's why it came about, right? But I, I don't think we could have easily come up with this idea if we didn't really invest time in the other works, let's say. Yeah, sometimes you arrive at a solution uh, uh, by exploring some other solutions, right? It just seems counterintuitive because um, like it, it is so simple compared to the other, other yeah, methods, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, but our goal was to push for simplicity basically after seeing everything that we have seen <laughs> up to that point. Okay. Okay, basically uh, the, the key idea here is to group rather than rank basically. And I think there may be other uh, variants of this that are better than uh, this incarnation of bliss. Here we have just two groups basically. It's uh, basically our observations that don't do full ranking uh, because of the reasons we have discussed. Just monitor the applications as opposed to doing full ranking, group them into two uh, groups, vulnerable and interference causing. And you can see that there's some similarity here uh, to a TCM, right? Uh, so vulnerable applications, are prioritized over interference causing applications. Right? So there's low, uh, hopefully this is low complexity compared to ranking. And that is true, as you can see in the paper's results. Uh, and also at least the lower slowdowns than ranking because full ranking actually uh, delays some applications a lot because you get delayed behind many applications. Whereas here, between the vulnerable applications, there's no ranking. Between the interference causing applications, there's no ranking as well. So applications just make progress basically. So none of them get, delayed unnecessarily because you may have made a poor choice in ranking, right? Okay. 
so then the question becomes, of course, how do you classify applications into groups? And here I think uh, Bliss enables a new idea, basically. Uh, I mean, these are all new ideas also, but you can see similarities between, like the goal was to actually simplify this ranking. Now you have only two ranks, vulnerable and interference causing, and within each rank, uh, you, have, you, uh, you have some other ordering, which is FRFCFS in this case. But basically the second observation uh, sees that, uh, says that serving a large number of requests, consecutive requests from an application is what really causes interference. So basically stop that, meaning, uh, blacklist some applications because they've they've been behaving, let's say, in a manner that could potentially cause interference. And the idea is, if you have uh, if, if 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 applications have a large number of consecutive requests, if an application basically uh, uh, gets serviced with a large number of consecutive requests, blacklist that for a while so that you don't prioritize it. You can also kind of see that this is kind of uh, least attained service in a in a much more, much more quick manner, let's say that. And then you deprioritize the blacklisted application and you clear the blacklist periodically every thousand cycles, basically. You can see that this is operating in a very fine-grained manner, right? All of the other mechanisms are coarse-grained, quantum-based, because you need to do this heavy ranking and enforce the ranking. This is very, uh, much more fluid, let's say. It's a very different scheduling algorithm from that perspective, right? If an application has generated, let's say, six consecutive requests, there's a blacklisting threshold. You can see in the paper, it's also evaluated, right? six requests consecutively and to get serviced, okay, it gets deprioritized for some time. This doesn't mean that you don't service that application. If some other application uh, generates requests, that gets prioritized over this blacklisted application, right? Unless that is also blacklisted, right? That's why you have these groups. So basically you have lower complexity, certainly, uh, because tracking this is also very easy, how many uh, requests have been serviced consecutively from which application, you need to keep track of that. Uh, and you, have, you need to have a bit saying blacklisted or not blacklisted for a given application. And then you prioritize uh, non-blacklisted ones. And this finer gain grouping decisions lead to actual lower unfairness. And this is also uh, likely the cause of the performance improvements as well, because you're not really, let's say you're not regulating too much. If I think of the other pri uh, prior scheduling mechanisms, they're very, let's say harsh, let's say, right? They're regulating maybe too much, right? They have, you have all these threats, and you rank them in some manner, and you obey that ranking for 10 million cycles. But who said that you should do that, right? Maybe you're really missing a lot of opportunity. Here, it's a different idea of it. At a very fine grain, you're basically saying, okay, you use too much bandwidth in your last some number of requests, you're gonna be deprioritized for a while. But it's not too long. Don't worry, it's only thousands of cycles. So it's not heavy handed, let's say. So I think it's a much more flexible policy and uh, I like it because of that reason. And that's, I think that's the reason for the performance and fairness benefits as well. It's, it makes these decisions much more fluidly and quickly. Okay, and as a result, uh, you see that its fairness is almost as good as the best. Its simplicity is almost as good as the best and its performance turns out to be uh, better than the best prior in this case. And these particular workloads again, right? This may be workload dependent. I mean, this is work also workload dependent because it has thresholds also, right? When do you get blacklisted? When do you go back from being blacklisted? And these are the thresholds that you need to optimize. Okay, I already said this. Okay, and uh, the paper has more evaluation. I'm not gonna go into this in detail. You can find it in the paper. Uh, okay, basically, yeah, you can see that we're closer to ideal in terms of performance uh, and it balances the performance and fairness. Clearly there are some schedulers that are better at fairness, but their complexity is higher as we will see. And this is complexity in terms of critical path latency as well as scheduler area. And keep this with a grain of salt. I mean, you can optimize all of these schedulers to be less complex, right? But there's not enough time to optimize every single one of them. So this is based on a limited amount of time spent for optimizing all of these schedulers. Ideally, your critical path latency and area should be zero, right? And you should still achieve what you want to achieve. And FRCFS is quite good, as you can see. Uh, PARBS, ATLAS, uh, TCM, as expected, kind of. And uh, you can see that uh, this is blacklisting. So blacklisting gets you very close to FRFCFS. Okay, and that's the idea, basically. Any questions? Yes. Mm, I think I don't really understand the Pareto front um, trade-off between performance and fairness, because it seems that um, this Atlas is, um, is like a very strong case for the strength of fairness in terms of improving performance. 
right? Like in fact, in fact, it seems like this basically says that bank level parallelization is a weaker force in terms of improving performance and fairnesses because this performs better than Atlas, which is a lot, which exploits a lot stronger bank level parallelization uh -huh. um, by improving fairness. And so, um, Atlas doesn't improve uh, back goal. Um, well, Atlas exploits both in a sense because it does ranking, but it doesn't. Uh, whenever it does ranking, it doesn't take into account fairness, right? Yeah, I guess I'm just saying like that. Um, mm -hmm. It seems to me like Atlas is showing that there's a correlation mm -hmm. between um, fairness and performance. And sure. the Pareto front seemed to show there was a trade-off between the two. Sure. So I guess I'm I'm confused about. You mean this, this picture here or? Yeah, I mean, it's also dependent on the workload, right? These are different workloads uh, compared to the studies that I've shown you that were done a few uh, some years ago, right? But certainly, improving perform, improving fairness also improves performance. Uh, but uh, there are other reasons why you improve performance. For example, uh, I mean, bank load parallelism helps, but it's very hard to, I think, uh, robo for locality also helps, uh, but it's very hard to distill exactly why your performance is being improved, right? I think I, I don't have a good answer to that. <laughs> Even after studying this for decades, <laughs> I don't have a good answer to that. <laughs> okay, so I guess like the Pareto front was just like um, something that was observed um, for a exactly, few exactly. It's observed basically. It's not theoretical basically. I don't know how to draw these curves theoretically basically. No idea. Okay, that makes sense. I can guess, but workloads are very complex, right? And and there's it's not just one workload. Also, we're dealing with we're we're dealing with in this case, I think twenty four cores, four memory controllers. There are many workloads that are getting mixed and they're interfering with each other. Uh, there are dynamic effects. There's something that's going on in this memory controller and this other memory controller. It's very hard to theoretically model all of this. Right? Yeah. Okay. But it's good to think about it. I think it's good that you're thinking about it and questioning it. Okay. We discussed this and there is an extended version uh, of it also. Okay, I think last thing I want to cover, unless there are more questions over here, in uh, memory controllers is something that we're going to look at later, but something that's also important that none of the prior works examine. Yes, please. Yeah, it's just like, um, does the, um, was there any uh, research on whether or not a machine learning approach could match the performance of Bliss? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, as far as I know, no. I think that's a very good direction, actually, looking at... Uh, looking at how machine learning uh, works. But machine learning needs to be also designed uh, for fairness in mind a little bit, right? But yeah, we didn't, we didn't do that comparison. I think that's a very good direction. Yes. Okay. Ah, it's working. Oh, is this used in any real memory controllers? So the real answer is I don't know, <laughs> but I suspect yes. Uh, I mean, this is uh, this is actually the last memory scheduler that we developed uh, because uh, we've been doing a lot of memory controller research and we've been transitioning to some other research. I think I'm very interested in doing more memory controller research also. But my guess is it's actually some of the principles it actually uh, uh, provides is used in some memory controllers. Yeah. Because of its simplicity, right? I mean, even Atlas, actually, some of the principles are in some memory controllers. But this is also an unfortunate area. Well, not, I think in general, industry used to publish papers describing what they do in their memory controllers. Right now, if you want to, uh, uh, they, don't provide, they don't do that as much, unfortunately. It's a bit sad. Some, some companies do that, right? The Google TPU paper, for example. Uh, but in general purpose processors, like memory controllers, there are very few memory control controller papers you can find from industry. It's a bit unfortunate. If you can, you can scar patents and you can see similar ideas actually that were patented potentially, or at least submitted as patenting, but not necessarily granted because there's prior work in the area, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. And we work also with some companies, but it's a bit hard to discuss those issues, let's say. <laughs> But my suspicion, my strong suspicion is that, yes, uh, principles are actually employed. Okay, sure. Okay, so let's, let's go into this one. Uh, and this is something that's going to be a bit different. Uh, we're going to talk about multi-threaded applications. We're going to talk more about that later in this course. But so far, we've been assuming everything is independent, right? Meaning all of the threads are completely independent. 
What if the threads are actually coordinating with each other, meaning they have some dependencies? And I'm going to give you an overview, but if you want to learn more, uh, there's a lot more information about this scheduler. Plus, hopefully, we will talk about bottleneck acceleration, but uh, the principles that I'm going to introduce in this are, uh, can be useful for other acceleration mechanisms. So these are bottlenecks examples. Like you can, you can have a critical section here, you have a critical section here. Uh, threads based on the threads contention behavior and your data set behavior, uh, how many threads are waiting for this critical section changes over time. And how many threads are waiting for this critical section also changes over time, right? So this is multi-threaded programming. So there's very dynamic behavior in terms of what is your bottleneck uh, in terms of uh, which, which thread is bottlenecking your performance in a multi-threaded program execution. Okay, basically the key is if you have a multi-threaded application, a single application divided into many threads, these threads can be interdependent. And that basically changes everything that we have discussed so far. We've been assuming these threads are independent of each other. So as opposed to threads from different applications. So such interdependent threads can synchronize with each other with many, many synchronization constructs, locks, barriers, pipeline stages. You've probably seen many of these in your operating systems course, systems programming, parallel programming courses, right? How many people have seen I have not seen any of these, let's say. Don't be shy. Okay, everybody has seen, that's good. That's what I expected also. And multi-thread programming is also hard, we know that, right? Uh, and some threads can be on the critical path of execution due to synchronization and some threads are not. And that's what we're going to try to guess and use in our memory scheduling in this case. Which thread is on the critical path likely to be limiting the entire thread's performance. And we're gonna try to find that and prioritize that. I'm not gonna go give you a lot of detail over here, but in the later lectures, we're gonna talk more about that. And I think it's a very tough problem actually. Even within one thread, even if you're within a single thread, right? Some code segments may be on the critical path of execution, some code segments may not, right? And this is good to think about. Like some, some code segment is actually very quick and uh, it's not really uh, bottlenecking your execution because there's some other dependency chain in the thread that's actually much uh, taking much longer to execute. If you, if you think of a thread as a data flow graph, for example, uh, going from uh, input to output, uh, some dependency chains are fundamentally much longer, right? Uh, and some other dependency chains, their latencies may be overlapped with this long dependency chain. That's the critical path of execution, right? But of course, we don't know what that critical path would be until we execute the program. That's the difficulty. If you knew what that, because the latencies are dynamic, right? And, uh, and those dependency changes, uh, chains may, uh, uh, which, which dependency chains in a thread are on the critical path may change depending on the cache misses you get in the program, depending on how long some of the edges in the data flow nodes get delayed because of interference from other threads, et cetera. Right? So there are a lot of dynamic latency issues over here. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these very quickly. This may be a review since you've seen a lot of these and we're gonna cover these more uh, in later lectures. So I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. But critical sections are there to enforce mutually exclusive access to shared data. You can see one example of a critical section. This is a non-critical section. You do some computation and then you lock, you, you acquire a lock and then you update some shared data and you release the lock. And that's the critical section. Only one thread is supposed to be in that critical section if you've done this programming correctly, clearly. Uh, yeah. And clearly this causes a problem if many threads are trying to access that shared data, right? So in this case, we have only two threads. And you can see that uh, thread two comes to the lock and acquires it. It's in the critical section. And while thread two is in the critical section, if another thread wants the same lock, well, too bad, it needs to wait. Right? So this is why things get delayed, as you can see. There's some idleness. And we will see more pictures like this uh, later on. So the entire execution gets delayed if your critical sections are slow, as you can see over here. Uh, or you have unnecessary critical sections, et cetera. So basically contended critical sections makes, they make other threads wait and threads that are causing the serialization can be on the critical path of execution of the entire multi-threaded program. Barriers are another example. Barriers essentially are enable synchronization across many threads, clearly. Uh, usually they're used in a uh, single program, multiple data type of programming, for example, box synchronous programming. A lot of scientific programs are written using barriers. You partition the problem into many threads and each thread does uh, the operations, maybe similar, maybe very similar, or maybe the exact operations on different sets of data. And after they finish their operations, they have to synchronize 
and so that they can move to the next type of operations they need to perform uh, on the data, for example. Uh, for example, I like this. Uh, I, my, my, one of my favorite examples is counting the number of uh, different characters in the alphabet that appear in a book, right? You have a thousand page book, uh, you have 10 threads, uh, you divide uh, uh, the book uh, uh, to all of these 10 threads. Uh, each thread gets 100 pages. The first thread gets the first 100 pages. The second thread gets the second 100, and so on, as you can imagine. And each thread's job is to basically create a local histogram of uh, the number of characters in the alphabet for those 100 pages that are assigned to them. Right? And now you have, at the end of each thread's execution, you have 10 local histograms. Right. And that's the end. After, after all threads finish their local histograms, now you can start accumulating that to, be, to, to form a global histogram. Of course, you can program this in a different way so that you can reduce the synchronization, et cetera. But that's one reason you may want to synchronize. Each thread is computing its local data. And whenever you want to merge it with the global data, you wait for all of the other threads to finish their local computation. And then maybe one thread does the global computation. Right? Or maybe you still multiple threads do the global computation, but you partition the work in a different way. That's the idea. And this, I mean, this example is actually nice because it's, uh, uh, it, it will uh, give you something that I will show you in, in this picture. For example, the first thread that was assigned 100 pages, okay, maybe the first one, not the first one, the third thread, it was assigned 100 pages, and there are no characters in, that, in those pages. It's all pictures. That thread gets done very quickly, right, compared to other threads. If some other thread has, let's say, 100 pages of characters, long sentences, that needs to compute the histogram. But if a thread may have a data set that has nothing, uh, that, that basically finishes very quickly. It's just pictures in those pages of the book. Right? This leads to load imbalance, basically. The thread that gets assigned work that gets finished quickly, finishes quickly, and it has nothing to do. It just waits for all of the other threads to finish before uh, it gets to the barrier quickly, basically. Very uh, and it waits for all of the other threads to finish. So this picture that I'm going to show you in a little bit will show you that. So basically, this is it. Right? This is these are threads that are doing, computing their local histograms, and they wait for the barrier, and then they do something else afterward, or maybe there's something more complicated over here. And this is the thread that uh, gets to the barrier quickly, basically. So you have two threads in this particular case. Uh, this thread finishes its work quickly, and it waits for the other thread to get to the barrier so that it can move to the other part of the program, let's say, or the multi-thread execution can move to doing something else. Basically, that's the idea. Whenever you have barriers, threads have to wait until all threads or the specified number of threads can reach the barrier. Clearly, programming is rich, right? You can specify which thread should reach the barrier so that you can continue. Uh, but last thread arriving at the barrier is clearly on the critical path. Right? T2 is on the critical path right now. So if you accelerate T2, you will reduce the uh, multi-thread execution uh, 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 runtime here. And how do you accelerate T2? Maybe you prioritize its memory access. That was true earlier also, for example, here. If you accelerate, in this case, uh, uh, whatever is uh, causing uh, the critical path, you basically reduce the uh, time to finish the program. Okay, so that's barriers. Uh, one last thing, we'll cover this more. Uh, I don't wanna spend a lot of time right now since we have other things to cover, but this is also another way of writing parallel programs, like pipeline programs. How many of you have written pipeline programs, pipeline parallelism? Okay, that's good. As a programming construct, clearly we know about pipelining in hardware, right? It's not the same thing, although it has similarities as we will also see later. So basically loop iterations are statically divided into, by the way, did you do it in a class or? Okay, which class? Again? It wasn't ETH. Oh, it wasn't ETH. Where was it? EPFL. EPFL. Okay. <laughs> Parallel programming or? Uh, real time. Real okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Clearly, this sort of programs are also employed in real time systems. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, so basically, uh, you can divide uh, a loop into uh, uh, statically into code segments called stages. These are computation stages. So these are three stages, for example, ABC. There may be multiple reasons to do it. You may want to exploit locality of data, for example. These may be completely different computations, and they may be feeding each other in some way. Uh, well, we're going to see more examples of this later. But threads execute stages on potentially different cores. Uh, and thread that's executing the slowest stages on the critical path in this case. Right? So you can see that uh, 
all of the instances of A in this loop is executed in this core. All of the instances of B is executed in this core. All of the instances of C is executed in this core. And the reason might be uh, all of the loop iterations that are labeled A over here, part of the loop that are labeled A, may be working on the same data set, for example, right? As a result, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, whatever loop iterations you have gets executed over here so that you exploit good locality over here. That's one reason, of course. There are many reasons why you may want to do this. And then you have very little communication between A and B, but still there's some communication. So B needs to wait for A uh, until you communicate that value, right? Okay. So basically, uh, if you look at the execution of this, it may look like this, basically. Thread one executes A's first iteration. Thread two executes B's first iteration. Thread two executes C's uh, first iteration, or first iterations B, A, B, C, let's say. That's probably better. Uh, B is taking too long. As a result, the second B cannot start. And that, gets, that delays uh, all of the other pipeline stages, if you will. T1 and T3 get delayed, basically. So by improving the performance of B, you can actually accelerate the entire pipeline computation in this case. Figuring out what is the bottleneck in your pipeline base, which stage is taking the longest. That's the throughput limiter in this case. Okay. Okay, so basically these are three uh, things that are handled in this work. Uh, and we already discussed that some threads can be on the critical path, some threads are not. The question is how do we schedule the request of interdependent threads to maximize multi-thread application performance? I'm gonna give you the idea, not the implementation. But the idea is to estimate the limiter threads that are likely to be on the critical path and prioritize their requests. That's the idea. The question is, of course, how do you do this estimation? I'm gonna give you the basic idea, but not going into a lot of detail. So, okay, these are the limiter threads. These are the bottleneck threads. Then what do you do with the non-limiter threads? There are a bunch of threads that are not on your critical path and that are not expected to be on your critical path. Basically shuffle their priorities. The shuffling idea applies here also to reduce the memory interference among them. And the paper has a method of doing this in a good way, of course, and you can see this. But this is a hardware software cooperative problem. The limiter thread estimation, uh, actually software helps with this. The thread that's executing the most contented critical section, for example, is a limiter thread. The thread that's executing the slowest pipeline stage and the thread that's falling behind the most and reaching a barrier. These are actually helped with the software as we will see in the bottleneck acceleration lecture. Okay, let's take a look at the scheduling policy. So uh, in this particular cooked up example, you have four threads over here. And uh, this part is a non-critical section. And critical, there are two critical sections, green and orange, as you can see. Uh, there's a barrier, as you can see over here. And uh, the, this dashed blue line is uh, waiting for the critical section, basically. Let's say, and this is one particular dynamic execution. And you can see similar execution profiles with many multi-thread applications, basically. So if you compute the critical path, you do it at, at the end of execution perfectly. You can figure out which one was on the critical path and trace it back, trace the execution back to the beginning. You can see that different threads are on the critical path, right? But one, one thing is clear. The thread that's on the critical path is the thread that's executing critical section one. So basically, because critical section one is the most contended critical section, you can see that many of them are executing. The main reason why you see these blue, dashed blue lines where threads are waiting for the lock is because of critical section one. So if you can somehow estimate this dynamically, then you can prioritize the requests that are coming from threads uh, uh, that are executing critical section one, let's say. So basically, that's the high level idea. You uh, dynamically identify which threads are limiter threads. And then you basically say, okay, I figured out that the most contended critical section is critical section one. And the limiter thread currently is D because that's the one that's executing critical section one. So I'm gonna prioritize it. Now the limiter thread keeps changing as you can see, it becomes B because that's the one who is executing critical section one. And I'm gonna prioritize it. And you can see that prioritization enables it to get out of the critical section more quickly because its memory requests are prioritized assuming these are memory intensive. And then a uh, limiter, thre uh, limiter thread is C at this point because it's executing the critical section. So I'm gonna prioritize it and you keep doing this. And the hope is that you reduce the critical path such that you reach the barrier much earlier. So you save some cycles in this picture. And if you look at the critical path, it looks like this. It may have changed also, but it's still uh, the green threads in this particular case or, or the, uh, the threads that are executing the green, green critical section in this particular case. So that's the basic idea. And clearly there are a lot of details in terms of how to make it work. Yes. 
So how would you do this identification? Yeah. If threads were busy waiting instead of actually using system provided logs. Uh, yeah, I think busy waiting. So if uh, that's that's why I'm going to point you to bottleneck acceleration lecture. So we're going to see that later on. Basically, you can count how much busy waiting a thread has done. Also, if you have some, enough hardware support. Yeah. Is critical section just um, an er uh, yeah um, an area of memory? Well, critical section is uh, what I showed you earlier, right? This is basically uh, the. Uh, it's, it's basically accesses to shared data, this part. This is the critical section. You basically lock, do some operations, and unlock. And nobody else can, can take the same lock at the same time. Right? It's, it's mainly there to enable updates to shared data in a safe manner. OK. 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 So. There are very good questions. I think uh, you'll need to wait for the next lecture or watch the bottleneck acceleration uh, lecture or see the uh, paper. Okay, so assuming this, uh, so and the results are actually quite good over here. If you look at the results uh, with parallel applications, now you're much more targeted. You basically figure out which thread is on the critical path and the performance improves significantly on, especially those parallel applications where locks, critical sections and barriers uh, are contended and they're, there's imbalance in the pipeline stages as well as the uh, threads. Okay, so clearly there are uptides. This is the first scheduler that improves the performance of multi-thread applications explicitly, at least. If you throw a TCM, thread cluster memory scheduling to multi-thread multi applications, you actually get some performance benefits. But this is trying to exploit the interdependencies uh, to, uh, to get performance benefits in a more principled manner in these applications where threads are interdependent, right? It provides a mechanism for estimating limiter threads, as you will see later on. And it opens a path for slowdown estimation for multi-thread applications, actually. I think this is very interesting. This is still an open problem, in my opinion. Uh, how do you estimate the slowdown? Uh, we, we see, we've seen an example with STFM, stall time fair memory scheduling, for example. But we don't know how to estimate the slowdown of a many-threaded, multi-thread application, for example. Okay, downsides or limitations. What if there are multiple multi-threaded applications running together? This is how you extend it, right? And that's a real system. You have multiple multi-threaded, or some of them are single-threaded applications running. And I think this is actually not that hard. You can, you can imagine doing uh, what I just described in a single multi-threaded application, and you can imagine using the principles of the other schedulers. Uh, but of course, you need to think a bit more deeply uh, to adapt them uh, to this multiple multi-threaded application case. Uh, Limited thread estimation can be complex, and that's absolutely true. You will see that. Uh, there, there needs to be hardware support for it. Uh, and that's the paper that I mentioned <laughs> for you. Well, for everyone, if people are interested. And that's the paper. And uh, again, uh, if you're interested in uh, this more, this is a fascinating topic, I think. How do you identify the bottlenecks or limiter threads, as we call this in this paper, in multi-thread applications? And how do you accelerate them? And how do you actually do it for multiple multi-thread applications, which is done over here? But the goal was not really to do memory scheduler over here. So once you identify limiter threads or bottlenecks, you can do a lot with them, right? So uh, identification can enable you to do many, many things, right? You could, you could accelerate these threads in the memory scheduler. Uh, you could execute these bottlenecks in a specialized core that can actually execute them extremely fast so that you can get rid of, it, rid of them very quickly, right? This is what's kind of being done in this work, uh, but not exactly because it's, Basically, this work assumes heterogeneous cores. You have large cores versus small cores, like we have today. The idea is to execute the critical parts, parts of the program in the large cores that can execute things fast. And everything else execute in the small cores so that you can do it efficiently, because it's not critical for your performance, hopefully, assuming you do the estimation right. So basically, once you have information about what part of your program is critical and what part is not critical, then you can actually enable many, many different acceleration or energy saving mechanisms, right? You don't, don't waste a lot of energy on things that are not critical, for example, right? If it's not going to, if you can delay things such that they don't become critical, uh, maybe you get a lot more power efficiency from your system, right? Okay, and you can read these papers. And again, this is the lecture that I mentioned. Okay, what we are not going to cover because I want to cover emerging memory technologies, uh, but if there's later uh, time in the lectures, this, other topics that are also quite interesting, like memory scheduling for heterogeneous systems, right? I'll just give you the uh, basic thoughts. Clearly, we systems are like this today, right? And this is, uh, if you remember the Apple M1 picture that I showed you earlier, it's exactly like this. Although this picture, these sort of pictures that we were drawing much earlier than 
they did the Apple M1, let's say. So basically, you have heterogeneous agents. You have uh, CPUs, GPUs, hardware accelerators. Even CPUs are different from each other. Uh, you have shared caches. Some caches may be shared between the CPU and the GPU or the hardware accelerator, clearly. And going forward, you have a lot more heterogeneity in the memory system also. So the question becomes, how do you schedule memory requests from these different agents to mitigate interference and provide quality of service? Clearly, they have different quality of service guarantees that they want. Okay, and this is just a picture to see that this is actually real today. When I was presenting this maybe eight, 10 years ago, it's not, it was not real at that time, let's say. Okay, uh, but basically uh, you can see it, right? They, they even have a shared cache across uh, uh, GPUs and CPUs. They don't talk much about it, but that's my expectation uh, that the shared cache is shared across many of these accelerators actually. Okay, but I'm not going to talk about this. This is also an important problem. How do you actually, now, now all of these accelerators, different CPUs, GPUs, hardware accelerators are generating requests to the main memory controllers. How do you actually do the scheduling? And there are some works that tackle this, but we don't have time. Now, the problem actually becomes uh, even more interesting because complexity becomes an even bigger deal in the system. Because GPU, for example, when it generates requests, it generates lots of requests. So you need to have really huge request buffers. And then a lot of the algorithms that we discussed become less and less scalable. Uh, they don't work as well. So we, we developed something called stage memory scheduling that kind of looks like this that basically breaks down the memory scheduler into three different components. And each component is actually quite simple. Uh, but again, we don't have time to talk about it. You can also watch about heterogeneous computing systems. I'll just flash some of the papers. This is a stage memory scheduling paper. This is, uh, uh, this is actually a more general paper. Uh, even though the ideas are orthogonal, they were developed, let's say, somewhat concurrently. Uh, but they can be this can be merged with the stage memory scheduling ideas also. But here, we actually take into account deadlines as well. How do you actually satisfy the deadlines of different uh, accelerators? Okay, that brings us to predictable performance. So what we're not also going to talk about is very strong memory service guarantees. Like if you have a deadline, how do you ensure that you satisfy the deadline? Uh, it could be a very hard deadline, life critical. It could be a somewhat softer deadline also, right? You may miss, you may be able to miss some 1% or 0.1% of your deadlines uh, without hurting anyone, let's say. Uh, but predictable performance is actually a general topic and uh, it's important for the cloud also. That cloud, like predictable performance in the cloud is like soft uh, predictable performance, right? Uh, you want to satisfy some service level agreements. In the end, you miss some deadlines. Maybe it's okay, right? Because nobody gets hurt in the end, hopefully, unless the, what you're running on the cloud is a safety critical application, which is usually not the case, right? Uh, well, I hope it's not the case, actually. <laughs> you, don't say, you don't send your safety critical application to the cloud because that may cause some reliability problems as well, right? Uh, but basically, on, uh, in the cloud, uh, to satisfy the service level agreements, you may it require strong service me memory service guarantees also so that, uh, let's say, you don't slow down an application by more than X percent. And again, we, we're back to the same situation, basically. This, these are the systems that we're dealing with on the cloud also. Okay, but again, we don't have time. Uh, I will point you to some uh, lectures. Uh, so basically we, here we look at uh, whether we, what kind of quality of service bounds we have and do we meet them? And uh, if we don't meet them, can we actually predict that we do not meet the uh, quality of service bounds so that we can take some action, right? Meaning tell the operating system, you scheduled too many applications on me, so back off a little bit. Right? So basically uh, it all boils down to, of course, doing everything at a high performance. Ideally, you should be able to meet quality of service bounds and you, pr you predict that you actually are meeting them. Uh, but whenever you're not able to meet them, because it may not be in your control, right? If you're, uh, if you're at one component, like the memory scheduler, you, it may not be under your control uh, to actually satisfy the quality of service bound that you're given. You, you're basically uh, told to not uh, slow down this application by more than 5%, but that's not in your control. The applications that you're dealt with from the, mem from the scheduler, thread scheduler, make it impossible to satisfy that bound, right? And that's, per that's also possible, right? So uh, whenever you design a component, you should also add mechanisms if you want predictable performance that say, okay, I cannot do this, basically. And you basically raise the problem to somewhere else. And that's very important. Okay, and these are some predictable performance reasons. You can see that fairness, the source throttling is one example of this. Uh, their memory scheduling algorithms uh, and uh, slow down models. I would recommend looking into these. And the dash scheduler is another example of predictable performance actually. But again, we don't have time. 
We also don't have time for other quality of service approaches, and there's a lot here. And I've already uh, flashed at you these things. And if you have time, I would suggest looking at it. Some of these may be uh, potential readings that you can do to get credit, for example, in your homework, memory channel partitioning, source throttling. And there are many, many source throttling mechanisms and thread scheduling mechanisms. There's also more data center policies, actually. Once you start talking about quality of service and resource management, you do resource management on chip, you do resource management across the data center, across multiple connected chips. So it's actually a big field, let's say. Uh, but again, we don't have time. But let me summarize. Uh, so these are uh, the scheduling techniques, uh, the fundamental interference control techniques that we discussed. We've covered them at different levels of detail, clearly. We focused a lot on the prioritization. But it turns out best just to combine all, actually. You, need, you want to do all, basically, if you want to get the highest performance uh, and also uh, better predictability, let's say. And again, how you, do, how you would do that in the best way, uh, it's an open question. We've talked about smart versus dumb resources, right? Uh, and these are some examples. Both reports are effective at reducing interference, actually. Uh, and emp empirical results show that very, very well. If you read the papers, you will also find that. But there's no single best approach for all workloads, basically. You really want to combine these again. We talked about several techniques, scheduling, throttling, partitioning, for example. All approaches are effective, actually. In the end, you can make them effective. Uh, can be applied at different levels, hardware versus software also. Uh, like where do you push the work becomes interesting. But again, there's no single best technique for all workloads over here. So usually combined approaches and techniques are the most powerful. And again, this integrated memory channel partitioning and scheduling paper talks about that. Uh, but I think overall, uh, what we have discussed uh, is if you have quality of service unaware memory, that's not a good thing, basically. You have an uncontrollable, unpredictable system. And providing quality of service awareness provides performance, predictability, fairness, and utilization, better utilization of the memory system as well. And we discussed many new techniques to minimize memory interference, provide predictable performance, even though we didn't discuss it. You can imagine things, right? Uh, and I think many new research ideas are still needed uh, in this domain. What we did not cover is also quite interesting, like prefetches. Uh, how do you co-design different components, right? We talked about a lot about DRAM, but how do you actually uh, co-design the caches, DRAMs, and DRAM controls at the same time? Uh, cache interference, something we did not cover. Clearly, there's a lot of research in how do you partition the caches. I think it's interesting, but uh, maybe a bit less interesting because that's more well-trodden, let's say. Uh, many people have looked at it. Uh, in fact, uh, people used to joke that International Symposium on Computer Architecture, ISCA, is really International Symposium on Cache Architecture. That's the <laughs> that was the joke, but it's not. Hopefully, it's not true anymore. Let's say uh, caches are good and very effective, but you don't want to keep working on caches for all your life, right? <laughs> it's a bit clearly we know the limitations of caches. If caches don't work, they don't work. If you have random access, they're not going to work. But memory controls are there; they have to work for all cases, right? That's one of the reasons why I focus on memory controllers here, because uh, if uh, some other system components don't work, you're back to the memory controller. You have to get it from the memory controller base. You cannot operate always on your, in your caches. OK, even though you may be continuing, uh, you, people may be building caches and caches and caches and caches right today. OK, uh, I mean, there's a lot of other things like interconnects. Hopefully, we will get to it at some point, uh, right to read scheduling. So, there's more complexity, basically, than what we discussed, and it's good to be aware of it, basically. Okay. And processing in memory is actually very interesting also going into the future. How do you do quality of service and processing in memory, for example? These are some ideas that I think uh, these are some open directions, in my opinion. Uh, and certainly, looking at more complex systems is a very open direction. There have many accelerators. We need many goals, memory quality of service techniques, but also performance, energy, et cetera. How do you achieve those techniques? We need a lot of new ideas, in my opinion, over here still. Uh, the combinations of memory techniques that we discussed and some of which we did not discuss, I think how do you combine them becomes interesting. And I think I will mention this again, but because this is such a complex problem, there are so many dimensions to it, and there's so many heuristics that have been developed, I think managing the complexity is becoming much, much more difficult today. So we really need to investigate like how to make it easier for humans to manage the complexity, let's say. I think real prototypes is also interesting. Uh, how do you actually uh, test these ideas with real systems that you build? Okay, I think that brings me to the wrap up finally. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. 
is the main motivation for real prototypes just the extent of the testing you can do? Because I, I noticed. Yeah, exactly, know. exactly. Okay. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, real prototypes are not always needed. For example, if you have a new idea and you want to demonstrate it, like Bliss, for example, you clearly don't need to build a real prototype. But real prototype enables you to uh, test many more workloads much faster. So if you take, for example, a soft MC like DRM memory controller that we discussed, if you modify it so that you can add these some memory scheduling policies, let's say, and also some uh, workload mapping uh, mechanisms, you can investigate much more. In simulation, it becomes uh, it, it's very slow. Basically, we'll we'll hopefully have electron simulation that where we will discuss this. But there's a trade-off clearly. But uh, if you want to especially uh, look at operating system and hardware co-design, real prototypes can be useful basically. But again, the downside with the real prototypes is you're limited to what you can build, right? Your imagination may be, uh, and your creativity may be much larger than what you can actually build. <laughs> That's why I think real prototypes are good, but simulation is also good. Simulation enables you to get to the insights beyond what, what is buildable in uh, today's technology. Yeah. It's just interesting because I think like, Bliss is um, like simulations are only 200 million cycles, which I think is a tiny fraction of a second. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and you will see that. I mean, that's true for many, many architectural studies, right? Like if you, if you look at some of the ideas that are implemented in architecture um, in the past, they were not even simulated, some of them, right? Caches, for example, in the 1960s, people didn't really have the notion of even simulating. If you, if you read the original cache papers, they basically say, Okay, we expect there's this locality and here are some reasons for it and we're gonna build it. <laughs> Auto order execution is another example. Uh, it, it was actually uh, built by IBM first, but it didn't work very well because they didn't have precise exceptions, right? Uh, but if you look at the later out of order execution papers that uh, talk about uh, precise exceptions, uh, there were very limited amounts of simulations. If you're lucky, maybe thousands of instructions. Yeah. Yeah, but simulation is fundamentally slow. But it enables you to get to a place uh, that you can imagine or that your creativity uh, enables much faster. So it enables these big leaps, let's say. <laughs> That's why I think in, uh, it's good to evaluate the ideas as much as uh, they, they require evaluation, let's say. <laughs> let's say don't overdo evaluation. <laughs> If you overdo evaluation, you may delay the ideas, for example. I know you didn't ask this, but this is some thought process that I have in my mind. <laughs> uh, anyway, you can think about it. <laughs> okay, so I think this is a really good time to take a break. Let's take a traditional 16 minute break. Let's be back at 14, 45. And then we're gonna start uh, emerging memory technologies.
Okay, let's try to get started. Can you hear me on Zoom or YouTube? No feedback? Yes, uh, we hear you. Okay, great. Okay. Now we're gonna continue with something else unless there are questions that are burning about memory controllers. I don't hear anything. Okay. Okay, then let's switch to uh, switch gears to emerging memory technologies. I mean, clearly memory controls will be important here also. Uh, but this is also a very exciting area because it's always good to keep in mind what new technologies can enable, right? Especially with the scaling issues that we're having with DRAM. And I mean, I will, if, if we have time to get to the end, uh, I will end this lecture with uh, imagining what any new technologies have enabled us, right? So this thing, for example, has flash memory in it, right? And it's amazing that it has flash memory in it. That memory technology was invented, let's say, 40 years ago. And people kind of ignored it by saying, oh, who is going to use this technology, right? This technology has a lot of problems, et cetera, et cetera. But starting in early 2000s and more recently in 2010s, let's say, clearly flash memory has enabled a huge, let's say, change in our lives, right? If we didn't have flash memory, these devices would be extremely bulky, for example, and also slow, right? So that technology, for example, is a great example of what was emerging, let's say, 20 years ago. Even 20 years ago, it was emerging, I would say. Uh, and now it's dominating our lives, right? I don't think you, you want to go back to uh, a future without flash memory. How many people want to do that? Yes, you will probably have less storage to waste. For sure, <laughs> but life would be much slower, actually. But that's that's the uh, importance of uh, doing research in emerging memory technologies. It's very speculative, and you will get a lot of naysayers, meaning people will say, oh, okay, who's going to need this? I mean, we have DRAM. Today, they will say we have flash, right? 20 years ago, they were saying, oh, who's going to need it? We have DRAM and hard disk <laughs> to dismiss flash, right? So that's the mentality, I think. So, and you need to be I think uh, if you want to innovate, uh, you, you basically cannot close the door for these new technologies. Uh, and yeah, because they can, they can enable huge benefits, right? But of course you need to be careful about what they may bring, right? Because on the other hand, uh, you also have, let's say these marketers uh, who have some <laughs> agenda and their goal is to basically uh, try to sell you this new technology as if it's uh, better than sliced bread. It's the biggest invention in the world, right? It's, uh, you could find, and they exaggerate things, etc. Uh, I think some of this happens in, let's say, quantum computing today, for example. It's going to solve all of the world's problems, etc. Well, okay, let's look at it in a more reasonable and scientific way. Is it really going to solve all our problems, or can it really solve all class of problems? Let's say, example, right? I think uh, whenever you have emerging memory technology, you need to be very balanced and scientific about it, because you can you can go either way, right? It's a you can say, oh, okay, existing technologies are great. Why are we dealing with these? Or you can say, oh, this emerging technology is going to solve everything. And that's the hype part, right? And the real answer is somewhere in between, basically. And that answer needs to be determined scientifically. And also, in the end, the production needs to follow what actually uh, you find scientifically. Okay, so with that, I think let's start this lecture. But this lecture is really about uh, enabling something that is completely different. And we're going to talk about it from the context of memory. Uh, I've shown you the slide before, actually. Limits of charge memory. Uh, clearly, it's difficult to place uh, and control charge in charge-based memories. Flash memory, we did talk about very little, but I mentioned you, uh, you can look at lectures. This is a flash cell. You have a floating gate. And basically, charge gets trapped over here, and that's how you can actually uh, store data. In DRAM, it's a capacitor charge. But basically, dealing with charge is very difficult, uh, as we discussed in DRAM. Reliable sensing becomes difficult as you reduce the size of this charge storage unit, right? You become more vulnerable to noise, and we've seen many effects of noise in retention, read disturbance, row hammer. Similar effects exist over here, which we briefly discussed in flash memory. And in the end, uh, 
as you reduce the charge storage unit, you fundamentally have a limit, right? Because you, you, you have a difficulty of retaining, retaining data over here in both technologies. And also storing data. Like you keep reducing the size of this floating gate. Uh, like how many electrons are you going to be able to store uh, in a given size? That's the scaling limit, let's say. So, okay, this, these are some slides that I've shown you actually, right? Uh, how do you actually solve the scaling problems? We discussed overcoming memory shortcomings with memory-centric system design, new memory architectures, interface functions, better waste management, like memory compression, which we didn't talk about, but in the future we may talk about it. Uh, so there are a lot of things we will not talk about that are quite exciting also, like how do you better utilize your memory with compression, for example, just, we just don't have time uh, for it. Uh, that's why we're not covering it. Yet. So we discussed there are many key issues to tackle, reliability at low cost, energy, latency, bandwidth, reducing waste in terms of capacity, bandwidth, latency, and enabling computation cost data. Actually, we covered a lot of this basically in the remaining, in the earlier lectures. And all of these ideas can be applicable to emerging memory technologies also. We've covered it, especially in the uh, context of DRAM. It's really applicable to many, many technologies. Okay, and we've discussed some of these papers over here. Now let's talk about emerging memory technology. This was a solution too. You also, you also saw this slide actually, when we talked about memory trends and opportunities. Basically, I said that so there are some emerging memory technologies that seem more scalable than DRAM, and they're also non-volatile, and these are resistive memory technologies, meaning uh, they store data in terms of, they encode data in terms of resistance of the material. One example is phase change memory. Uh, data is stored by changing the phase of some special material. There are different kinds of materials that can enable the sort of phase change, let's say. The chalcogonide glass is one of them, but you will see another example in a, in a, in a table that I will show you in a little bit. Uh, and data is read by detecting the material's resistance. So you have two phases and you switch between two phases reliably, let's say. And these are old numbers, but this is expected to scale to very small nanometers compared to nanometers DRAM was at at that time, right? In 2009, DRAM was at 35, 40 nanometers. And these folks were saying this is expected to scale to nine nanometers. Right now, the expectation is even lower nanometers. This is the feature size. And it was even prototyped at 20 nanometers when DRAM was at 35, 40. And so clearly, uh, the, and this is, a, this is a very nice paper actually uh, in IBM Journal of Research and Development uh, that talks about the phase change memory technology. And it's also expected to be denser than DRAM because you can store multiple bits per cell because you can you have this resistance range and you can chop up the resistance range into uh, different windows. Uh, and that, that way you can encode data. I'm gonna show you a picture of this also in a little bit. But of course, uh, Again, I could be a marketer and say, oh, this is better than sliced bread that came up. That's better than anything before. It's always good to realize that emerging memory technologies, whatever memory technology, whatever technology it is, they have shortcomings. It's always a trade-off. There's no idea in the world that's perfect at everything, basically. It's clearly important to understand what those trade-offs are so that you can actually do something with it, right? Yes. Um I wonder how, how can it store multiple bits because there is only one bit line. Oh, I'll, I'll show you basically. Uh, you basically sense uh, the bit line uh, for longer. Basically, the time it takes to, uh, let's say, drain uh, the data that you read from here uh, determines, uh, 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 de determines what value you store. I'm going to show you an example of it. You'll see more. But flash memory is another example. It has only one bit line also. But again, uh, you read it multiple times to actually see uh, what data is actually stored there. Okay. Uh, okay. So basically the key question is, can we enable these technologies to replace, augment, or maybe even surpass DRAM, right? Because depending on the characteristics and the usage, uh, they may either replace, uh, they cannot replace potentially sometimes, but they may surpass in some cases because they're non-volatile. Okay, and we're gonna see some of these works that we have been working on also. But this is uh, like today, this is real, meaning there is, it's still emerging, but it's real, meaning there is already chips you can buy. And you can buy this actually, I think by paying a lot of money to Intel. Uh, this is phase change memory based uh, 3D X point technology. And you can put it on your memory slot and this could be your memory. And you can test it. You can figure out what the characteristics are. Uh, you can do many, many interesting things. There is a version that's storage also, SSD version. There's Optane SSD version, as Intel calls it. Uh, you can use that for storage. So basically, 
the same type of technology can be used for either memory or storage. And we'll see its characteristics also. And that's this is basically real today. There's also another real one that's for STT MRAM, as we will talk about, but it's not as uh, commercially uh, uh, why, uh, like as, as common uh, right now uh, in the commercial space. Yes. And how much is it? This, oh, this chip? I don't know. Can, can somebody do a search? I think it's uh, it's a lot uh, more expensive than uh, the era. Does anybody know? If I had to guess, 10x at least. But I'm not sure, really. I think it was 10x at some point, maybe more than 10x. But you can probably find it online. Yes. I found it for 550 francs. Okay, that's that's not bad actually. How how big is the capacity? Okay. That's actually not bad. I mean, it says reduced apparently because when I was uh, looking at this, it was probably around the time it was released. It was more like 2000 or so, if I remember correctly. So you can see that emerging technologies also scale over time as production capability, production facilities, manufacturing capabilities become better. People have more experience. People have more expertise uh, to manufacture them. The cost also reduces. And apparently that's what's going on. That's what I would expect also. So it's actually not 10x, much uh, much closer uh, to the year. Maybe maybe it's going to surpass the year at some point. Actually, it's it's expected to actually because it's more scalable. Right? That's what I would expect. But maybe I don't know if it already surpassed because I don't know the DRAM price exactly. Does anybody know? Maybe you can search for 128 gigabyte DRAM and look at the price also. <laughs> okay, okay, but this is real. And uh, but uh, a lot of research has enabled this. Clearly, architectural level research we're going to talk about. But there's also a lot of device level research that has enabled this. You should take a look at some of the references in this paper, for example, that talk about a lot of the device level research. I'm going to show you some of those references as the, in the form of a table. Uh, but there. Uh, uh, Paper from IBM Journal of Research and Development is also very important. And these are some of the papers. Okay, now let's discuss a little bit more what this technology is like. So charge memory, uh, DRAM and flash, uh, you write data by capturing charge and read data by detecting voltage, resistive memory. That's what we're going to talk about. And turns out uh, these current pulses to write the data are actually much more scalable as opposed to capturing charge uh, in, the, uh, in the device. And we're going to, there are many different read methods actually out of this. So what has enabled these technologies is uh, these devices, uh, read devices that can actually read the data reliably out of the uh, cells. And there are three classes of technologies that are quite interesting. There are other technologies also, but I'm not going to focus on them as much. These are the resistive ones. Uh, one is phase change memory, one is STTM RAM, and the other is, let's say, the general class of RAM, memristor type of technologies. In phase change memory, you have multiple phases. You inject current to change the material phase, and resistance is determined by the phase that you're in, basically. STTM RAM, you inject current to change the polarity of a magnet. We're going to see this also. It's, a, it's magnetic memory, basically. By injecting current, you basically make the magnets parallel or anti parallel to a reference layer. And resistance is determined by whether uh, the uh, reference, uh, whether the uh, free layer is parallel or anti parallel uh, to a reference layer. So basically, the polarity of the magnets. And memristors, RAM, RAM, these are actually quite diverse, let's say. But in many cases, you inject current to change some atomic structure of the material, and resistance is determined by atomic distance internally in the material. Yes? What exactly is the material phase? I have no idea what it is. Oh, okay. We're going to get, uh, get into it. Basically, material exists in two different kinds of phases. Uh, these are, let's say, states, right? They look different. The bonds are different inside, uh, between atoms. Uh, we will see that. I'm going to show you pictures of it. I think the best way is really pictures. And then you need to go to the device level if you really want to. Okay. But basically, the takeaway is these are all resistance-based uh, memories. Uh, based on the technology, uh, what determines your different resistance levels is clearly different, right? It's very technology-dependent and the device-dependent. But if you abstract it at an architectural level, at some point, they're very similar, right? You, you have, you're storing one or zero, they have different resistances. That's how you encode one and zero. That's the, that's the idea, basically. OK, so let's go into a little bit more detail. So uh, this is an example with chalcogonide glass. Basically, there's some material, special material. You can see the chalcogonide glass over here. Uh, and this material in nature exists in two states, let's say, amorphous and crystalline. And these are two states that have different properties. Uh, one is amorphous state has low optical reflexivity. If you shine light on it, it doesn't reflect as much. 
whereas crystalline state, high optical reflectivity. And it turns out the amorphous state also has higher electrical resistivity and low, uh, crystalline state has low electrical resistivity. So you have these two states that are fundamentally different from each other. And you can encode data based on which state the material is in, right? And it turns out you can switch the cell reliably between these two states, reliably and relatively quickly. Okay, so uh, optical is interesting over here, right? So we, we're gonna talk about resistance over here and people have actually built a lot of devices over here to make the reading fast. But this material existed since 1960s, basically. People knew about it. And uh, what uh, people used it for actually rewritable CDs. How many people use rewritable CDs? I think, okay, so you still use it. So you probably have some sort of phase change material in it. It doesn't necessarily, it is not necessarily chalcogonite glass, but that phase change material enables optical reading uh, of the CD drive, uh, for example. Of course, that's a very slow process, right? What people invented over the recent years, uh, 1990s, 2000s, especially 2000s, early 2000s, uh, and later after that is to figure out how to read this material uh, by exploiting the resistance levels in a much faster way without using optical devices, basically. And it turns out, you can, and so that's where, uh, that's how a lot of technology innovation got enabled, basically. Uh, these read devices actually that are discussed in the IBM paper that I mentioned, for example, are quite important. IBM and Intel, especially, these are the two major companies that have pushed toward this and that have enabled this, even though other memory companies also uh, did it. IBM and Intel actually were, were perhaps the most leading ones, let's say. Yes. Yeah, so did they use multi-bit cells in the optical disks? Or so that's a good question. I mean, uh, uh, I believe so, yes, but I haven't looked at them <laughs> recently. It's good to look at it. Because uh, we, we had these optical disks and then we had Blu-ray disks mm -hmm. and th those were much higher capacity. And then they suddenly, let's say, got replaced by flash drives. Yeah, well, so <laughs> density is much... Okay, it, it was- And also some speed, right? Speed is a huge uh, difference between a flash drive and a CD. Because the initial flash drives had very low capacity and yet people preferred them. And it, it, it was quite strange to see such a high capacity technology die out yeah, yeah. so quickly compared to- Well, I think we can uh, guess why that happened, but form factors are another example. I don't, I don't think we can fit a CD here, right? <laughs> With, uh, yeah. But that's, a, uh, I guess, yeah, it's a, I think your point is very good actually, because there was some other technology that I was not motivating you with, which is a CD uh, technology. Apparently some people still use it. It didn't die out completely yet. Uh, so they have use cases, but yes, in the general domain, we don't see that many CD drives around, right? Like I used to have a laptop with a CD drive in the past, a DVD drive also actually, but it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, I think I, I would say again, that's the success of flash memory technology like flash memory, right? Yeah, good point. <laughs> yes. Is it right also from the, the line or is it from some other input to trigger the heater? Yeah, I'm gonna talk about that soon. Yes, it, it goes through, through the heater, yes. Okay, so let's, how does it work basically? So basically, if you want to do it right, you need to change the phase via current injection. You need to inject enough current such that you cause a phase change in this material, right? So if you want to set the cell, for example, you need to send uh, sustained current to heat the cell above some crystallization temperature. So this is the example. Uh, if you want to reset the cell, assuming to zero, for example, encoding, of course, is different from setting resetting, but you need to sell, uh, you need to heat the cell above some uh, melting temperature very quickly and then quench it very quickly also. So the heater plays a big role, basically. There's a controller over there. And that's part of the reason why writes are very slow, as we will see. Writes are very power intensive because you apply very high temperatures. So writes are actually problematic in this technology, basically, Con compared to DRAM, right? Compared and contrast this to DRAM, writes are very easy in DRAM. You just go through the bit line and write something, right? It's just chart sharing. Writes and reads are fundamentally not that different in DRAM, right? and their latencies are symmetric complete. But now our rights are going to be very expensive and this technology is going to have problems because of that actually. Uh, it's bandwidth, right bandwidth is going to be lower also because uh, your power limited whenever you're doing rights and you cannot do as many rights concurrently basically. Yes. 
since this one is also dependent on temperature to do read and writes, how sensitive is it to uh, temper? Like, how is its performance sensitive to temperature changes compared yeah. to like DRAM? Yeah, so I, I don't think there's a lot of data related to that. It's certainly sensitive, uh, but yeah, I don't. I mean, you need to do the writes reliably. So, uh, so you need to design this controller that's changing the temperature to the resetting and setting reliably. That's no question about that. But how sensitive is, it, uh, is the performance to different operating temperatures? I don't think we have enough data to look at that. So that's one of the reasons why these technologies are emerging. There's not enough data in everything, right? <laughs> Even though you have chips, there's not enough data still. Okay, so read is simpler you detect the phase via material resistance in some way. There are many different read devices. I'm gonna show you one example uh, soon, at least conceptually, but you somehow need to detect the material resistance, right? So it's that you distinguish between two different states or different resistance levels. If you're storing one bit, you just need to distinguish Amherst versus Criston. If you're storing multiple bits, you chop up the resistance range into multiple levels and basically based on something that distinguishes those levels, you uh, get the num uh, multiple bits. But this is what real, basically. You can see that this is the set state. It's a low resistance state, crystalline state. You can see that its resistance is quite high, uh, uh, but uh, well, quite high, uh, quite low compared to the other state, let's say. And these numbers take it with a grain of salt. They change, of course, right? Depending on technology scaling, et cetera. Uh, and this is the reset state, basically. In the reset state, you have very high resistance over here. And they, you, can, you can observe them differently also. You can see the heater, et cetera, in this picture. Uh, but the key thing is there's a huge resistance range, 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 7, let's say. And you can reliably detect, distinguish between this resistance range. There's enough margin, basically. Okay, so let's take a look at it. Uh, so that's the device level. That's as device level as I will get. Maybe I will go into a little bit more. But if you're really interested in how the device operates, you should really read the papers or take a device level course that talks about phase change memory. But the opportunity architecturally and system level is this type of technology scales better than DRAM and flash because it requires current pulses which stay, scale linearly with feature size, as opposed to relying on electron movement, charge sharing. Uh, uh, it's, it's expected to scale uh, to nine nanometers. Well, I, I already said this. I'm not going to repeat it, actually, basically. But it can be denser than DRAM. I'm going to see this. Uh, we're going to show this uh, soon also. And there were prototypes as early as 2008 with two bits per cell. And you can see how old this slide is, basically four bits per cell expected by 2012, but clearly we have had four bits per cell and there are more bits per cell that pe people are looking at actually. And it's non-volatile. It can theoretically retain data uh, for more than 10 years at high temperatures, but there are other reliability issues as we will see briefly. No refresh needed, low idle power. So you get rid of a big scaling problem in DRM, right? Refresh. We spent one lecture, one of the health lectures on refresh maybe. That's such an important scaling problem. If you have this technology, you get rid of that problem or transform it to something else, let's say. Maybe not get, get rid of the particular refresh problem. Yes, you don't need to refresh it, but there are other issues as we will see. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Uh, how, do you, how do you actually read uh, PCM? So PCM resistance actually uh, determines your value over here. And you basically have a resistance range, minimum maybe 10 to the two maybe is today, and maximum maybe 10 to the seven today, for example. And you basically distinguish uh, between one and zero, having a referenced resistance, let's say, in this case. Of course, it doesn't always work that way, as we will see later. And multi-level cell basically says you can increase the density a lot more by storing more bits per cell. But multi-level cell phase change memory has some drawbacks. It's, it's higher latency and energy because uh, determining multiple levels actually takes more time uh, compared to single level. And this is the example, conceptually, of a multi-level cell, right? You have the same resistance range, 10 to the two to 10 to the seven, let's say. You chop it into four buckets, let's say, four windows. And each of them encode two bits, right? Because there are four, you can distinguish them to, within two bits. Okay, we're gonna see more of this basically. The, the downside here is, the upside is clear, you, can, you have more capacity. The downside is there's less margin between the values. So potentially you have reliability problems. You need to be more precise in terms of programming, heating and cooling so that you ensure that you actually write the correct data value because now you're dealing with smaller margins and also higher latency and energy, right? Uh, because it takes more time to distinguish what level you're in as opposed to a single level, right? Single level, we have one reference. Here, fundamentally, you have three references, right? 
one, two, three, right? Okay. Okay, we're going to get back to this picture, so keep this in mind. Uh, but this is a fundamental trade-off. Capacity, latency. Capacity, reliability, right? We've been covering this fundamental trade-off. It's another incarnation of that fundamental trade-off. You want more capacity? You have to pay the latency. You want more capacity? You have to pay the reliability costs. And energy also comes with more capacity. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, a bit more architecture. So what we did when we were actually looking at memory a lot, uh, it was clear to us that DRAM is not going to scale forever. And we need to look at other solutions. And uh, uh, we started this uh, around 2007 when I was at Microsoft Research. And we surveyed prototypes. At that time, there was no real phase change memory device, let's say. Uh, there were, well, no real device that you can plug into your computer, let's say. There were, of course, uh, small circuits that people have uh, designed and they're testing in very unconventional ways, but you cannot plug a four bit uh, phase change memory, for example, in your computer. Right? It's useless from a system level perspective. Uh, so we surveyed prototypes that were published in device conferences, for example, and circuit conferences. Uh, and we derived some parameters for uh, a feature size of 90 nanometers. Clearly, this is old, right? Uh, but that's what you deal with in an emerging technology. First of all, if your people give numbers, you're lucky. Uh, and if people give really state-of-the-art numbers, you're even more lucky. And some of them don't even have state-of-the-art state of the art, uh, feature sizes, right? And these papers describe it. I'm going to show you this picture. Yeah, this is what I promised earlier, right? These are some of the prototypes that we examined, technology survey. These are some papers basically written by other people. Some of them are memory companies. Some of them are Intel, I think, actually. Uh, and you can see these are the year of the prototype. Process node, you can see that these are huge process nodes. Uh, you can see the array size. Actually, some of them are big, but not as big as what you want. Uh, and you can see, uh, yeah, the materials are different. And yeah, cell sizes. Anyway, these are not, not all of them are important, perhaps. But you can see that they're, because it's an emerging technology, the numbers report are quite different from each other. Read times, even read times are quite different, but we can guess some things perhaps, right? Uh, and you can see the read current. So a lot of the cases, you don't even have the numbers. Right? These, these are basically cases. This information is not available in the publication site. And you can see that's about half of the uh, cells in this matrix, if you will. So that's what you deal with in an emerging memory technology. You don't know exactly what you're dealing with, but you can guess and do some averaging and do some boundaries, right? Uh, what else do I want to tell over here? Yeah, basically we work with these numbers to do some architectural studies, but I will mention one thing over here. This is write endurance. We discussed this when we talked about flash. Whenever you write to this memory, because writes are so, let's say, destructive in terms of what you do to the device, you wear out the device. And you can see that in some cases, you need to do only 10 to the four writes. That's 10,000 writes so that the cell dies basically, it becomes unusable. But some other people report 10 to the nine over here. So there's a huge range as you can see. 10 to the four and 10 to the nine are huge different, hugely different numbers actually. Even today, it's not clear what write cycle, what write endurance you have, for example, from obtained persistent memory. I have no idea. Does Intel advertise it? I would be very surprised if they advertise it. Anybody know? Yeah, we can probably check. Uh, so this is actually a downside of the technology, this write endurance. And yeah, at this point, we don't know also. Okay, but we're going to cover that. We're going to take, take that into account in our studies. But basically, the takeaway is clearly there's some effort going on, and it's not clear if this will pan out. The question is, can we actually examine it architecturally and perhaps develop architectural techniques to make it work? That's exactly what happened to flash memory also, if you think about it. Flash memory was enabled by a lot of architectural techniques that enabled the flash translation layer and the SSD controllers. Of course, one of the first questions is, where can PCM fit in the system? Is it part of the caches, main memory, storage? And you can, you can, I think, easily think of the processor chip as caches because most of it is caches. That's a joke, of course, right? <laughs> but uh, clearly it's not gonna replace the processing elements over here, so it can replace the caches potentially. So main memory is actually a good place. So uh, of course storage, right? You can always replace storage and uh, there was no question in our minds about replacing storage, but that's the easy task, if you will. Uh, can you replace main memory? Is, uh, that's a harder task. Right? So if you look at the latencies of this memory technology, its latency is comparable uh, to DRAM. This is a typical access latency in terms of processor cycles for some uh, 
assumption of uh, a cycle period, you can see that PCM is very close to DRAM. I'm going to put some numbers to it, but you can see that it's about 4x over here difference. It's much faster than flash, orders of magnitude. And clearly, flash is much harder than, uh, much faster than hard drives, as we know already, right? Uh, and you can put your CDs over here somewhere if you want, <laughs> or DVDs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so based on the latencies, uh, it's a much, uh, it, it's, it's good to try to replace DRAM, right? Or it could be another level after DRAM, or it could be a hybrid to the DRAM. So all of these ideas now come about because of this picture, right? Uh, and certainly it can replace flash, right? Uh, or it can be used together with flash in a hybrid storage system. So there are many, many things you can imagine if you look at this picture and if you're a creative architect, let's say, right? Uh, and all of those ideas are ex actually explored at this point. Uh, and clearly it has replaced uh, flash in some cases, right? If you're willing to pay the cost because it's more costly than flash because of its characteristics. Okay, let's take a look at these numbers. Let's put some numbers over here. So read latency is slower than DRAM, but much faster than flash. Write latency is unfortunately much longer than DRAM. It's comparable to flash. Unfortunately, it's missing over here, but it's much, it's actually faster than DRAM, faster than flash also, sorry. Uh, uh, but I don't know the exact number over here. We should really extend this with flash numbers over here, Mohammed. <laughs> Uh, okay, but it's uh, much uh, slower than DRAM. So it's going to be a challenge, right? These latencies are going to pose us a challenge. These are red because of the reason, uh, because they're much slower than DRAM still. Like in the big picture, they're closer to DRAM compared to flash, but if you look at it from a finer point of view, we're still much slower. And right bandwidth, unfortunately, is much worse than DRAM also. That's a 10x order of magnitude difference. And this is because, again, writes are expensive. You're heating something to high temperatures, right? Okay, there are more, more bad news. Energy is not good compared to DRAM. Read energy is okay. Maybe you can tolerate it potentially. It's still 2x. Write energy is 43x because of the heating structure. And these are old numbers. Keep that in mind. New numbers have probably scaled much better, hopefully. But I don't have the new numbers. Uh, I don't think many people advertise the new numbers, actually, at this point also. Uh, because now, now they have business interests, right? If they put out a number, people will challenge it, right? And it's going to be difficult uh, for them to maybe, uh, yeah, and they may not want to even deal with it. All right, okay. So it's similar to Flash. Endurance is a problem, clearly, compared to DRAM. So DRAM, uh, so basically, uh, as you heat the device to very high temperatures, the contacts that you have degrade because of thermal expansion and contraction. As a result, at some point, device becomes unusable, a single cell, right? Uh, and basically, we assumed in this work that you can, you can only do 10 to the 8 writes per cell. We were a bit optimistic, perhaps, right? Uh, I'm not sure if, you, if it, the Optane SSD or Optane persistent memory, you can get 10 to the 8. Maybe, maybe you can. I think this is going to become better over time, potentially, with manufacturing techniques. But we'll see. As the capacity reduces, as the capacity increases and density increases, this also will go against this endurance problem, right? Uh, okay, but basically, this is much worse than DRAM. DRAM, as we know it, doesn't have an endurance problem, basically. Or we have not studied it long enough to uh, demonstrate those endurance problems. But basically, it's not a, practically not a problem in DRAM. But practically, this is a problem in this technology. It's much better than Flash still, right? Flash is actually much worse in terms of uh, endurance problems. Cell size is one thing that's actually good, uh, even though it's uh, basically, it's, uh, it, it can be much uh, lower uh, size than DRAM, basically. And it, they will, it will scale with feature size. Basically, it's, it's better than DRAM in this case and better than NAND, uh, clearly. And it will uh, scale with feature size. Okay, with multi-level cell also. Okay, so let's abstract it basically in terms of architecture, uh, architectural uh, pros and cons, right? So pros over DRAM is better capacity and cost, better technology scaling, it's non-volatile. So it can be used for persistent data, low idle power, no refresh. Cons are unfortunately there and significant. Higher latencies, especially write, higher active energy, especially write, lower endurance because of writes and reliability issues that we are not going to discuss as much, but uh, it turns out, even though this doesn't require refresh at a fine grain, whenever you have resistance, it turns out over time your resistance drifts. Like charge, you lose charge, you also lose some resistance over time. This is a much larger time scale than milliseconds. So it could drift in 
days, for example, right? And so you still need to refresh this a little bit, basically. This is, this is called the resistance drift problem. And of course, other, there are other reliability issues uh, like write disturbance, read disturbance, et cetera. But some of these properties are not very well known because it's not easy to experiment with these devices. And clearly the manufacturers that are manufacturing them are not going to talk to you about advertiser reliability issues, right? But they exist, yes. <laughs> Maybe yours doesn't work as much as well. Uh, how much cheaper or expensive than DRAM is PCM? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you were you were doing that uh, study earlier. You found out that it's well. Okay, basically, uh, initially it's not going to be cheap, right? Initially, it's going to be expensive. And as I said, I think two years ago it was two thousand. It was probably ten x more expensive. But over time, we expect that because of better technology scaling compared to DRAM, uh, there's a curve basically. Uh, okay, maybe I should draw this. I don't know if you really want to uh, make the effort of switching and etc. I will not. Hopefully, people online can see it. Okay, maybe I'll switch. Why not? Let's try how 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 fast I am with Zoom. So share screen. Do I remember correctly? Switch camera. What do you think? That was not slow, right? Okay. So now you can see it, but basically this is your time. <laughs> this is your cost. And whenever uh, you introduce a new technology, okay, maybe time zero is when you introduce the technology, right? And DRAM is here, for example. Okay, I need more colors. One, two. Yesterday we did not have four. Okay. <laughs> or maybe I don't know how to count. That's a possible thing also. Yeah, whenever you, so DRAM is here, and its cost is, okay, let's say reducing, I just made it up. Its cost is not going to reduce at some point, perhaps, right? But this new technology may start out, I don't know, here, but because it scales better, maybe its cost is going to be like this, right? So that's my, that's our expectation. Of course, this is very hard. I mean, cost is very hard to uh, determine, but, this is kind of the curve that we had seen with hard disks and flash also actually. When they were first introduced, uh, well, maybe hard disks and flash are not uh, uh, the best comparison, but <laughs> yeah, you see, you see what I'm getting at, right? Uh, basically the cost per bit uh, at some point will cross DRAM because DRAM is, cost is not reducing as much. You have all these scaling problems, but you don't have as many scaling problems over here. So that's the expectation. Yeah. Well, based on my quick research here, it looks like if you want to get one stick of just conventional DRAM, that's 128 gigabytes, it's going to cost you over a thousand francs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. DCM. Exactly. There you go. So it's already cost effective, basically. <laughs> it may depend on the DRAM type, perhaps, but yes, uh, that's uh, 128 gigabytes is huge, actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's go back. Okay, and this needs to be enabled again. Yeah, maybe it's good to do a similar study for uh, flash memory uh, and uh, NAND-based flash memory and PCM also. It's gonna be harder to take over flash memory, but maybe it'll take over over time, who knows, right? If flash memory scaling doesn't go very well. Okay, okay. Uh, Okay, I think we've discussed all of this. So cost, I didn't intentionally put it over here because it's very hard to quantify and that's what we don't quantify in this work. But we will quantify performance and energy. So clearly uh, there are reds and there are greens. And uh, that's the case with all emerging technologies actually. I would say there's, that's the case with all technologies. Like some uh, people have sought uh, these uh, universal memory technology as some people try to market things as, uh, which is good at everything green at everything. That doesn't exist as far as I know. It's going to be, if you find that uh, you're either going to be extremely rich <laughs> or uh, you're omitting some things, let's say. <laughs> Basically, all technologies are a trade-off in the end. You, I can do this for SRAM. I can do this for 
I don't know, hard disk, I can do this for tape, but anyway, you get my point. So basically, if you are dealing with a technology like this and you're gonna use it in your system, you need to figure out how to use it, basically. Find the right way to place phase change memory in the system and mitigate its shortcomings as much as possible. Right? And depending on where you put this in the system, shortcomings may be important or uh, more important or less important. So that's why I say storage is an easier problem, right? Now we're comparing to the DRAM. If you compare it to flash, actually, cons are actually much less dramatic, right? As, and we've done, we've done it in the previous slides, for example. Endurance is actually higher compared to flash, right? Reliability issues are actually perhaps better than flash, uh, easier to solve potentially. Energy is actually on par with flash. Latencies are actually better than flash. So if you're replacing flash memory, NAND flash memory with this technology, that's why it's an easier problem right? comparatively. But if your goal is something higher, then it becomes a harder problem. That's why this, is, this problem is interesting to us, basically. We want to replace DRAM. And this is a picture from the original paper that we wrote, basically, well, the presentation. How should we uh, organize the phase change memory-based memory? This was our thought, basically. Initially, DRAM and phase change memory are far from each other and we need hybrid memories, but over time, phase change memory will scale much better and maybe it will replace the year. At least it's good to study the system to understand the boundaries of what we're looking at. That was our goal. So this hybrid PCM and DRAM, we're gonna get back to this. This is perhaps in the short term, it's easier, or maybe even in the long term, it may make sense, right? Because these are fundamentally uh, somehow difficult to merge technologies in terms of greens and reds. Uh, but this may also make sense in some systems, right? So this is what we wanted to look at basically. How do you design the hierarchy and course to overcome the phase change memory shortcomings? And that's what this paper does basically. What happens if you magically replace DRAM with phase change memory? Of course, we have to use simulation, right? We don't have real devices that we can do this with. And this is what we are going to assume. Density is not going to play a role. Basically, we are not going to assume any advantage due to the density of the technology. But as you, as you have shown, we already have a, are a much better advantage in terms of cost per bit, right? Uh, in phase change memory, it seems. Did you look at the SSD or did you look at the persistent memory? I guess DRAM, yeah. Okay, you, you told me the number for DRAM, sure. But then it's the DRAM, yes. But you looked at the persistent memory for the price, right? Not the SSD. Okay. Okay, so basically, basically what we're going to ignore in this study is the advantage in terms of capacity. If this technology is really higher capacity as we discuss it to be, there should be advantages coming from capacity too, right? Because you can create a much larger capacity memory system, main memory system. But we're gonna ignore that. Maybe you can, you can argue that it's unfair to the emerging memory technology, but I think it's good to know those numbers without capacity in play. So uh, assuming everything fits in this, assuming basically you, you have the resources to uh, have a large enough memory capacity, uh, whether it's PCM or DRAM. But latencies, you're stuck with them basically. Regardless of whatever resources you have, if you buy phase change memory, your latencies are like this. You cannot get away from this. And this is what we're going to assume. Read latencies are 4x higher than DM. Write latencies are 12x higher than DM. Endurance problems exist. Uh, it's held dies after 10 to the 8 writes. And energy is also worse than DM, especially write energy, as you can see over here. And let's take a look at experimental results. What we do is you replace DM with phase change memory in a system, reasonable system of, for its time, four cores, let's say simple, multi-core. Phase change memory is assumed to be organized exactly the same as DRAM, except this latencies and energy characteristics are different. And you run some workloads in your simulator, and this is what you find out. Your performance degrades by 60% compared to DRAM. Your energy increases by 120%, and your average lifetime of memory is 500 hours. This is for some definition of average lifetime, of course, right? But it's pre pretty bad, basically. You don't want your memory or some fraction of your memory dying after $500 because these applications are doing a lot of writes to memory, right? And memory is fast enough that you can do enough writes so that you can destroy a lot of cells in memory. So this is not going to work clearly. This is a pretty bad proposition to replace DRAM with phase change memory in this case. And you can see there's a lot more analysis in the paper, but uh, based on the buffer size, et cetera, but you can look at the paper. So. We tried to make minimal changes to the system to mitigate some of these shortcomings. And the idea was to actually change the organization of the phase change memory chip. So and we exploited the structure of phase change memory and the characteristics of phase change memory. So what we did was initially we assumed that phase change memory is going to be organized exactly the same as DRAM, but that doesn't have to be true. DRAM, you have sense amplifiers, right? Uh, 
And in DRAM, whenever you do a read, you destroy the data because of chart sharing. But phase change memory doesn't operate that way, actually. You don't necessarily destroy the data in your reading mechanism. As a result, you can actually have much narrower sense amplifiers and narrower row buffers, basically. So instead of having a wide, large sense amplifiers, organize us as uh, a narrow set of row buffers. And the hope is that you manage this as a nice small cache. And the hope is that you're not going to write from phase change memory array as much or read from the array as much. That's the idea. You organize row buffers in a different way so that you can get better endurance, latency, and energy because you don't write to the array. Well, there's also, you don't read as much from the array that also improves your latency rate. So this is good because basically the key idea is having some more caching before phase change memory actually helps all of the issues that you see with phase change memory. And then the second idea is uh, you don't, uh, because of the endurance problems and the slow write problems, you try not to write uh, to, the, to the array as much as possible. One way of reducing the writes is today's uh, writes in DRAM are done at the cache block granularity, right? 64 bytes or 128 bytes, depending on the size of your cache block. Well, but most of the time, only a few bits are modified actually in that 64 byte cache block. So just identify which, let's say, uh, which words uh, are modified and just write those words into the array. And that's the idea. Basically, I think my, uh, let's say half joking, but half correct, uh, Takeaway is that if you have this sort of phase change memory array, and if you want to replace DRAM with it, you'd better do enough caching and enough mechanisms to minimize the writes and reads to this memory. You have this array, but don't touch this array as much as possible. It's there for capacity. It's there when you need it, but try to operate outside of it as much as possible. Yes. So it's sort of like, Sort of uh, hard memory, sort of like really, really rarely used. As much and as possible, it, yes. Isn't that kind of, I mean, it makes sense, but it also is kind of bizarre that the best way to use the technology is to use it the least. Well, but that's true for DRAM also. I mean, people try to do a lot of caching, right? Uh, to not go to DRAM, right? It's not that different. Because this is just a little bit, this just has a bit more problems than DRAM. We basically exploit the same principles. Yeah. I mean, certainly, as we will see, there are other ways of using the technology, but this is, uh, we're trying to replace DRAM with this technology first. Right. Yes. Yeah. So if we increase the caching to avoid writing, uh, let's say that you increase the write buffers, yeah. wouldn't that make coherence much harder in these kind of systems? Well, not necessarily, because this is, uh, this is in the memory controller, inside the memory itself, right? So you assume that this is already written. This is actually inside the memory chip. I'm talking about cache coherence between systems which interact. So for instance, let's say that I declare this variable as volatile, and then the course of synchronizing on the main memory. But I don't want to write to the main memory because it's just a simple byte. Mm -hmm. so how do I, like, that would make coherence a completely different problem. I, I didn't understand that because, uh, again, this is not happening at the cache level. This is from the course perspective, the write is already done. Right? It's just inside a cache that's not visible to the core. Okay. In, okay inside yeah. the DRAM chip. Right? Okay. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. All makes right. sense. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yes. If we use uh, multiple row buffers or caches to prevent uh -huh. using phase change memory, then if we use something like SRAM uh, to replace as robot first, and wouldn't that just make PCM much more expensive? That's right, yes. But uh, if you look at the paper, we try to make it equal cost to DRAM because basically DRAM has large robot first. We're just going to reorganize them. Yeah. So there's a cost analysis in the paper so that we try to make it equal cost. Yeah. Okay, that's a very good question, basically. You can do exactly the same things in DRAM also, right? But uh, we try to, basically we try to do a fair comparison. Okay. So if you do all of this, which is not a lot, but uh, it requires uh, thinking. And you cannot also do some of this in DRAM, for example. You have to have large sense amplifiers in DRAM because you cannot, have, you cannot say, oh, I have a large row, but only sense it. I'm, gonna, I'm only going to sense half of it because everything else is destroyed if you don't sense it, right? But that's not the case in phase change memory. Okay, so if you do this, actually, the results are much better, but still, uh, let's see, it's not, okay. So basically your performance, 
loss becomes 20% as opposed to 60% in these workloads. Okay, not bad. Your energy becomes on par uh, with DRAM, which is actually quite good, but energy models are always hard to validate. So take this with a grain of salt. And your average lifetime of memory becomes much better than 500 hours. It becomes years now, right? Uh, and hopefully scaling improves all of these characteristics. But there are, of course, caveats here, right? Yes. Is it, is it possible to detect um, how, how much, um, like, <laughs> How, how bad the, the endurance has already become once the device is in use, like, like a battery indicator, like my iPhone can tell me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Battery. Yeah, yeah, and that should be done, basically. And internally, for example, existing uh, flash uh, devices do that. And internally, they, uh, they, uh, they have additional storage internally so that they don't use the blocks that have become bad, but they, uh, they, they try to use some other blocks. Okay. And that's one of the reasons they become slower over time also, right? As, as you keep writing to a flash device, uh, there is more management that you need to do to uh, close to its end of lifetime, let's say. Yeah, so it's very similar, yes. Okay, so the caveat is actually worst case lifetime is much shorter, there are no guarantees. So this could be an attack vector also. Somebody can attack your system by keeping on doing writes, right? So it, it opens up some write attacks, let's say. Uh, intensive applications actually still lose performance a lot. Like I think some of them lose 60%. That's a lot of performance loss still. Uh, and some of them uh, have a lot of energy also in, increased. Uh, and maybe we used optimistic PCM parameters. I don't know. And maybe uh, we don't use as many intensive applications as uh, there will be running, right, in real systems. So basically, even though these results look good and they're going to improve over time, it's still maybe not that good to completely replace the DRAM, right? Because I cannot guarantee... Uh, any of these numbers also, yes. Wouldn't the larger capacity in modern devices offset the second caveat? Which is the second caveat? Uh, large performance hit. So yeah, yeah, intensive. Yeah, but if you benefit from capacity, yes. If you don't benefit from capacity then, or if you don't care about capacity, if you say, okay, I'm gonna pay the cost of capacity. I don't care if it's DRAM, PCM, I'm gonna fit my application to this capacity then, yes. But if, yeah, you're right, uh, actually it will, benefit a lot as we will see in some other work that assume that didn't basically uh, assume that uh, capacity is equal. Yeah. Yes. It seems like there's a five-year warranty on Intel's um, persistent uh, uh, Intel's PCM. RAM. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that means that must be pretty confident that like <laughs> you can't really attack it and it will last for like a very huge, like huge diversity of workloads for five years. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, uh, so, okay. Uh, if you if you look at that persistent memory, uh, there's a lot of memory control and management that's going on internally. So certainly it, it should be taking into account everything that we've discussed so far, plus some reliable tissues. So my guess is uh, they're doing a lot of management internally, like wear leveling, as we discussed, right? Uh, as cells wear out, you level the wear so that all cells wear out equally, let's say, inside the device. Uh, they probably have additional capacity that they don't expose to the user so that if something wears out, they can remap the data over there internally in the device. Uh, yeah. But five-year guarantee is good, actually. So how much guarantee do uh, DRI manufacturers provide on DRI? That's the fair comparison, probably. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that's basically the takeaway. And you can read the paper for more detail and it's a shorter version. But yeah, this is real. And also I, sh I should say that uh, these are results from 2009, right? <laughs> Today we're in 2021. <laughs> in fact, 2009 is when the paper was published. Uh, the results are really from 2008 or so, let's say. Okay. Okay, but the idea is realized today, that's good. Uh, uh, but there's not enough information about how this exactly built. But you can find some latency numbers, for example. I don't have them off the top of my head, but uh, maybe you can look them up and tell me what the latency numbers look like. People have experimented with them, measured the latencies and bandwidth, for example. Okay, but let's talk about uh, some other interesting things related to phase change memory. Uh, reading memory, right? Uh, people are interested in this multi-level cell phase change memory. And it turns out basically, uh, when you chop up the resistance range into multiple levels, your reading uh, becomes different, uh, meaning you read some bits earlier than others. So uh, if you take a look at this example, this is a time-based reader, let's say. 
you basically have a reference voltage and you check the bit line voltage. And you basically, uh, over time, you detect uh, the most significant bit that's stored and the least significant bit that's stored. And it turns out it is, it's faster to detect the most significant bit first. So most significant bit is read first because of this picture over here, right? Over time, what happens, a cell uh, loses, uh, cell actually, uh, the bit line voltage over here keeps reducing. And compared to reference voltage, uh, you can detect uh, where you are, right? If your bit line voltage uh, was actually low to begin with, then you're in the state. If, you're, if it's high to begin with, then you're in the state, et cetera. So basically how long it takes uh, uh, determines what your value is over here, or your bit line voltage de determines what your value is over here. So if you look at this picture, clearly the most significant bit is here, one, one, and you should be able to detect it earlier than the least significant bit, right? That's the idea. Okay, another, maybe I'll, I'll explain it in a little bit more detail. Basically the read latency and energy of bit one is lower than that of bit zero. This is due to how you read it. So this is one example, one simplified example of how you read it. You have a PCM, multi-level cell, a PCM cell with unknown resistance, and you have some capacitor filled with some reference voltage. And you basically uh, wait for enough time and when this capacitor gets drained, you infer the data value. So when this capacitor gets drained, uh, essentially tells you what the value uh, would, would be inside this. So you have basically a relationship between voltage and time, right? And if the time, if, if, it, if it takes, let's say this window of time to drain the voltage, then you infer that the value uh, would be one zero. If it takes this much time to drain the voltage, then you infer that the value is zero, zero. That's the idea. So initial voltage, and once the PCI, some PCM cells, is, so, you, so you have some initial voltage in this capacitor, and then you connect the cell to the capacitor, and the capacitor starts draining. And after some point, the capacitor gets drained, and you look at the time. You can do this clearly by clocking, as we have seen in the previous picture. And you look at the time, and the time says, oh, okay, I'm in this range, so this must be a zero one. And you can do it differently, right? Okay, basically, uh, you must wait for the maximum time to read both bits, but some bits you can reach earlier. You can infer information about bit one before that time. So for example, this is the time it takes to determine bit one's value. Bit one, uh, yeah, clearly you know that at, uh, if, you, if you come, if, you, if, you, if your capacitor gets drained before this point, you know that bit one is one, right? As you can see, because in the remaining states, bit one is zero. But you, you still have not distinguished what is bit zero. You have to wait until the end to determine bit zero's value. Make sense? So if you're, if you're considering reading only bit one, this is much faster, basically. That's the takeaway. So if you can do actually intelligent data mapping in your devices, uh, you can actually uh, put, let's say, latency critical data into bit one in general. So that's one idea, for example. And actually, the picture is more complex than I showed you. Write latencies are also different. So all of these transitions from different bit values have different latencies and energies. So it's, it's basically this picture based on some technology numbers at the time. So you can exploit all of this clearly. Right? And this paper does it, but I'm not gonna go into details of how you do it, but doing different kinds of data mapping and buffering techniques, you basically try to exploit these low latencies that you see in the system. And you can see that there's a huge difference, right? For example, going from zero one to zero zero takes 0 0.3 X latency I think that's latency. Uh, well, well, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Okay, this latency, yeah. Uh, 0.3x, the latency of going from zero, zero to one, zero. And there are reasons for it, basically, because of the way you encode the data, because of the way uh, things operate, et cetera. So, and this is another example, 0.2x, for example, very low latency. Going from here to here is very low latency compared to going from here to here, for example, or going from here to some other encoding. So you can see that the values are quite data dependent as well as encoding dependent. So uh, data mapping and buffering techniques can actually make a big difference in terms of the performance you get out of this device. And internally, potentially, this, some of these ideas can be employed in a phase change memory controller, right? We don't know because none of this is open to us. Even the protocol is not that open, right? Okay, any questions? Now, let me give you another technology. I'm going to spend much less time on this technology, but this is also quite interesting. In fact, this technology is very interesting because uh, I don't know where these people who are marketing this technology are, but 
at some point, uh, maybe in 2009, 10, around that time frame, some people were saying this is the best technology ever. And they were marketing it in such a way that it would basically fix all of the problems we have with all types of memories. And there's some potential in this direction, actually. This, this technology is quite interesting because it could potentially replace caches as well because latency characteristics are so good, but it doesn't have good characteristics and everything. So there are also a lot of reliability issues. But uh, let's look into it. So this is a magnetic memory. Uh, as I said, uh, again, you have a special device. It's called a magnetic tunnel junction device. And it looks kind of like this abstractly, right? And you have uh, two magnets, basically. One is called the reference layer. It's polarity, magnetic orientation doesn't change. It's the reference. And then there is a barrier and then a free layer after that. So free layers orientation can be parallel to the surface layer or anti-parallel, okay? And the magnetic orientation of this free layer determines the logical state of the device, high versus low resistance. So in this case, this is a logical zero. In this case, it's a logical one, high resistance versus low resistance. Right? That's the idea over here. And basically you can control this device also with proper writing circuitry. You can push very large current through this magnetic tunnel junction to change the orientation of the free layer, okay? If you want to switch between logical zero to logical one, it just takes exercising that writing circuit. Again, there are a lot of interesting device level issues, but that's not the point of this course. If you really want to understand how this works, you need to go into the device level details, right? But there are also a lot of reliability issues on the device, et cetera. Okay, but if you want to read this device, it's also relatively easy. You sense the current flow out of the device and the different resistance values have different current flows, basically. And this paper abstracted in an architectural way right? because we wanted to examine, uh, can we actually use this for uh, uh, DRAM? Okay, what are the pros and cons? So this actually looks much better, at least on surface uh, compared to DRAM, right? So the pros are, you get it's very similar, basically, to a phase change memory. It has the same pros. Better technology scaling, it's non-volatile, low idle power, no refresh. Cons are much better than phase change memory. Basically, it has higher write latency, higher write energy. Uh, unfortunately, this con is very bad today, let's say. Its density is very, very high, basically. Its density, the size of this cell is closer to the size of a, a cache size, a cache, a cache cell size, which is clearly much, much larger than DRAM. Right? That's why it's very difficult to currently uh, replace DRAM. That's why people have invested in phase change memory, right? Because the size of a cell is much closer uh, to the DRAM cell. So it may make sense actually to use STTR RAM to replace L2 caches, L3 caches, L4 caches, which makes sense, I think, actually, which is more feasible in the short term, probably, when people are looking into that. Uh, but yeah, we wanted to push it further, right? We wanted to actually, can you replace DRAM? Because DRAM is perhaps the hardest to replace memory, in our opinion, right? and also uh, what seems like happening. So reliability issues always exist. Like any new technology has reliability issues, and this also has reliability issues. It's vulnerable to read, disturb, write, disturb, et cetera. And they, they need to be sold also, just like they need to be sold with any other memory. Okay, but you can look at this picture and say, why is it not a big contender for replacing main memory today? It's because of this current poor uh, density, right? So, okay, let's go back to this curve over here. If I have to, let's say conceptually expand this to STTM RAM. Good thing we drew it actually, thanks. Uh, if I have to con conceptually expand that, we're gonna expand it with STTM RAM, at least based on what I know. Of course, it's all a speculative curve, right? Clearly, I don't know the future. Uh, but let me pick a different color. Okay, I have only one color left. So maybe the cost of STTM RAM is, I don't know. I don't have I'm enough sorry, space over there. Sorry, could you swap the camera on the computer? Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, you can. Yeah. That's good, thanks. Yeah, maybe the cost of STTM RAM is somewhere over here or somewhere over here, right? And it's not clear how it will scale, right? Maybe it's going to go like this, who knows, right? We don't know, basically, <laughs> the future. <laughs> maybe it's going to, at some point, cross this DRAM curve, right? Maybe I do need to have the color, but you get the idea, I think. I don't need to draw the entire thing, but I guess for the sake of completeness, 
Okay, the ERM cost looks like increasing. That may be true with roll hammer. <laughs> that may be true actually. At some point, once scaling stops, your cost starts increasing because you need to deal with all of these reliability issues, right? And that may be the end of scaling. Yeah. So that's maybe the cure. <laughs> that's why, I mean, if I have to put the name over here, that's why STTM RAM is probably not a great candidate to replace DRAM at this point, right? But in the future, again, who knows, right? There may be a jump in the manufacturing technology and the curve may change also, right? The curve doesn't have to behave this way. With creativity and innovation, the curves change. Okay, so I'm gonna hide this again. But you can do this basically for all technologies speculatively clearly, okay. Now let's take a look, uh, that's not what I want. Let's take a look at, given these characteristics, uh, what do the results look like uh, if we actually do a very similar study, right? The study we did for phase change memory, we're gonna do the study for uh, STTM. Yes. So in what way does this have better um, technology scaling? Let's say it again. In what way does STT MRM have better technology scaling? Yeah, basically you can keep reducing the size of the magnets uh, without a lot of, uh, but it takes time basically, it takes a lot of effort. Yeah, again, you can read the paper for more details. Technology scaling is some, and it's a bit harder to argue for STT MRM in my opinion. In phase change memory, we understand it much better, but in phase change, in STT MRM, we have, uh, it's a bit harder to guess because technology scaling is also an argument for the future, right? So if you look over here, uh, basically it's all based on current operation, right? And current, we can, these current pulses, we can control much better, basically. But again, the cell size may uh, uh, be difficult to reduce to operate reliably. Today, we are at such a high level cell size. And in the future, we don't know where we will be. Okay. Okay, there's another level of freedom, which is also interesting, which also exists in patients at, at some level, but you can trade off some non-volatility for lower right latency and energy. Meaning, okay, you say, uh, basically, if I want to make my writes much lower uh, uh, latency and lower energy, similar to a cache, for example, I basically get rid of the non-volatility element by reducing the size of this magnetic tunnel junction. That's why I think this is also a good candidate for cache because you can actually get similar latencies and energies as cache, for example, but you get rid of the non-volatility as well. Okay, now let's take a look, uh, look at the results for DRAM based. We've done a similar study, four core, some main memory. You can read the paper for more details. But basically, we replaced DRAM with STTM RAM with some architecting mechanisms like rights management. You need to do the right management because rights are costly here. But the good news is reads are not as costly. Reads, read latencies are exactly the same as DRAM. That's what we assume over here. That's what we expect also. But the rights uh, are going to be longer latency. I think they're, uh, in this paper, we assumed 4x, but I don't remember, actually. You should like, take a look at the paper. And if you look at this, if you do the rights management of the rights, it's, not, it's actually not that bad. You get 6% performance loss, and you get significant energy savings versus DM. And you don't have the endurance problem. Okay, I forgot to say this, maybe. You don't have the endurance problem over here, right? So there's actually a very good, ben another, uh, another uh, benefit compared to phase change memory. So it's equal to DRAM in terms of endurance. That's the assumption. So the benefits actually look quite good. But again, because of the picture that we, that we showed over here, it's currently not necessarily a good idea to replace DRAM with STTM. Okay. Maybe we'll someday figure out how to manage this. Yes. Since these um, like new technologies seem to have issues with rights, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be possible to at least currently, since they have some major advantages, yeah. to use them for parts of memory that are read-only? Yeah, yeah, so that's a good point. Uh, yeah, maybe, right? <sighs> then you, you're, you're now talking about a hybrid memory system, right? Uh, you, you, have, uh, you identify your applications or requests and you direct the read intensive applications to this sort of technology and other stuff is handled by DRAM, for example, right? Yeah, and that brings us to hybrid memory technologies, basically, because uh, no technology is good at everything, uh, so why don't we put together multiple technologies and uh, manage it, manage them uh, based on the characteristics of the workloads, like read and write in this particular case, uh, such that the characteristics of the workloads match the characteristics of the memory they're using. 
Okay, and this is the paper for STTM map. Yeah, that brings us to hybrid main memory. So let's talk about this a little bit. And I think we've already covered this, so I'll go through this relatively quickly, and then I'll mention one work, and then we will stop. But this is basically a more viable approach today, as you mentioned, right? Since no technology has green characteristics in every metric, they have different reds and different greens. Why don't we put together multiple different technologies and design the hardware and the software to manage data allocation and movement so that we achieve the greens as much as possible while avoiding the reds as much as possible. And we've seen this example, and this is a huge challenge and opportunity today, basically, providing the best of multiple metrics with multiple memory technologies. And I think once you have a system that looks like this, you need more intelligence in the system also. Now you have a heterogeneous memory system, but it can also be configurable. It can also be programmable. The programmer can say, for example, put this data to this technology, right? And there are many issues over here. So we will start covering some of them very quickly. Should this be a cache? Should, we, should this be main memory? What is the granularity of data movement between different technologies? Who manages it? Hardware, software, hardware, software, cooperative. When do you decide to migrate data from one place to another, regardless of how it's used? And then if you're using it as a cache, how do you design a scalable and efficient large cache? Because some of these memories could be gigabytes, right? Okay, let's take a look at the first option. DRAM is a cache for phase change memory. Phase change memory is main memory and DRAM cache is memory rows and blocks. In this case, you get reduced latency on DRAM cache hit, and you also have write filtering. Writes are actually filtered by DRAM, right? They don't go to the phase change memory. And memory controller manages the D, uh, DRAM cache. This, the benefit is this eliminates system software overhead, right? System software doesn't manage the cache, memory controller does. So there are multiple issues here. What data should be placed in DRAM versus kept in PCM, for example? I'm, I'm picking PCM since it's the closest to reality. It's real actually right now. What is the granularity of data movement? How do you design a low-cost hardware-managed DRAM cache? So we're going to look at some of these directions, I guess, in the next lecture now. But I'm going to give you one more work before we part. So OK, I'm not going to. So this idea was actually initially proposed by this paper, this, which is concurrent to our paper. Uh, this is a paper from IBM uh, that essentially looks at a hybrid memory system that looks like this. The goal is to achieve the best of DRAM and phase change memory, as you look at it. It looks like this. The system kind of looks like this. This is your main memory right now, right? There's a DRAM buffer. There's phase change memory as main memory. And there's a write queue to handle the writes in a more nice manner, let's say. And the goal is to minimize the amount of DRAM without sacrificing performance and endurance. And DRAM is used as a cache to tolerate PCM latency and write bandwidth issues, all the issues that we're discussing. And PCM is used as a main memory to provide large capacity at good cost and power. So you, this is your real main memory. This is a cache, and this is a write buffer, basically. Now, how do you manage the write buffer becomes important. And this paper proposes multiple ways, for example, lazy write. So you take pages from the disk, you install them only in DRAM, and don't put them in PCM direct. Only if they're evicted from DRAM, you may decide whether you want to put it in PCM. Right? That way, you get rid of some of the endurance issues with PCM. Partial writes, very similar to the ideas we discussed. Only third lines from DRAM are page are written back to a phase change memory. And there's also page bypass. Discard pages with true reuse on DRAM eviction. There are some pages over here. Whenever you're evicting them, ask the question, should I actually put it to PCM or should I directly write them back to disk? Right. If, if you're writing back. If, you're, if, you're, if, if, if this is a data that's not dirty, then you can drop it also. Right. You, know, you can not write it anywhere. So these are actually interesting ideas also. Some of them have similarities to what we, have, we were trying to do. Basically, minimize the writes to this memory right, as much as possible. OK, let me give you some results, and then we will conclude. So these are actually results of, uh, let's say, less accurate simulation, but consider is the capacity now. right? If you consider the capacity, the results look much better, basically. So you can see that 16-core system. We're assuming 8 gigabyte DRAM. We're assuming we, we cannot model everything over here, uh, and the paper doesn't model. So there are some fixed assumptions. Main memory is at some number of cycles, for example, hard disk at some number of milliseconds, and flash at some number of uh, microseconds. And you assume a flash hit rate, for example, because modeling all of that in simulation is actually too slow. And there's an assumption PCM is 4x four, uh, denser and 4x slower at the same time. So this doesn't look at the read-write asymmetry. So there are some downsides, of course, but we're going to ignore that. So if you ignore all of that, the M block sizes, in this case, same as PCM page size. It's different from what we have. Uh, yeah what we looked at also, but the results are going to be similar, surprising. So, okay, these are some workloads that are interesting. Some of them are databases. This is eight gigabytes DRAM. If you actually use 32 gigabyte PCM, in many cases, your performance improves. This is normalized execution time, lower is better. Because these workloads can benefit from 
large capacity memory. You can see that going from eight gigabyte DRAM to a 32 gigabyte PCM improves your performance by about two X. Now, if you look at 32 gigabyte DRAM, which is a, perhaps a more fair comparison, equal capacity comparison, 30 gigabyte DRAM is actually much better still. Similar to the results that we see actually. There was a 60% difference in the end, and then 20% difference. You see a similar difference. But if you have 32 gigabyte PCM plus one gigabyte DRAM, the performance is actually very similar. So this is the hybrid memory system that buys you, uh, hopefully the cost is much lower than a 32 gigabyte DRAM system, but its performance is almost equal. Maybe there's a 10% difference over here, right? And that's the idea over here. If you look at the system level, uh, the benefits are actually quite good. And I think this is actually similar to what we have seen, except we don't look at the capacity benefits, but if you look at 30 gigabyte PCM and 30 gigabyte DRAM, that's what we uh, see also. Okay. Uh, this also, this, these are the energy numbers, power and energy numbers and energy delay numbers. You can see that the hybrid memory actually is much more efficient than a 32 gigabyte DRAM. Uh, but it's, it's consuming a bit more power. Uh, and it's also, wait a second. The, also, okay, this is normalized to uh, eight gigabyte DRAM, right? Basically hybrid memory is much more efficient. I, I, don't, I don't see the PCM numbers over here, so I cannot say anything about that. But, uh, but if you look at the, uh, compared to the DRAM systems, it's much more efficient in terms of energy, as you can see, because DRAM is much more power hungry as we discussed. And also uh, you get a, a very good average lifetime according to, this paper, again, 9.7 years, according to the calculations of this paper, but there are no guarantees. Again, no, guarantees are important potentially, right? Yes. How is it 9.7 years when the PCM should have a 500 day uh, sort of, how long, yeah, age? Well, 500 day was empirical also, right? Basically the key is really, you can do some number of writes to a cell. 500 day was basically if you, all of the writes are exposed. Here, uh, we are having DRAM and write buffer before PCM. Basically, we're, uh, th this work is also trying to reduce the writes as much as possible. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is the work actually. This is concurrently in the same session uh, as we where we present our work also. So there were actually three papers that talk about similar issues, if you will, at that time. Okay, this is a good place to stop because you can, of course, go further in hybrid memory. And I think in, uh, in, in the lecture, not next week, but the week after, uh, we're going to pick up on hybrid memory and also look at some other benefits of emerging memory technologies, like in-memory computation, like getting rid of some of the system inefficiencies in manipulating persistent data. But we don't have time for it. So in the next, uh, next week, we will have uh, lectures of cutting-edge research, let's say. You will get exposed to, let's say, eight really cutting edge papers that were all published in 2021, I think. So hopefully it'll be interesting. Some of them are going to be on issues that we've covered. Some of them are going to be issues that we have touched on, but didn't cover in detail. So hopefully it'll be interesting. Okay, if there are no questions, no burning questions, then we're done. Okay, you have a burning question. Other people can leave if they want. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking like, do you see also machine learning learning uh, being uh, applicable to here in the same degree as it is to memory controllers or is it like a fundamental difference in these two applications? No, no, I think again, machine learning could be a good application. And there, there's a small number of works that look at machine learning based management of multiple memories, for example, hybrid memories. But I see again, this is a very complex task also. If you can set up uh, your uh, problem such that you can express it nicely using a machine learning algorithm and show benefits, that's always good, right? Yeah, there's a lot of research in this direction that needs to be done in my opinion. Yes, one more. Uh, since the uh, write for PCM is through the heater, so for PCM, um, can the write and read um, be in parallel in the same band? Yeah, that's an excellent question basically. Yeah, usually no. I mean, even in DRAM, write and write doesn't happen in parallel because of the bus, right? But in PCM also, you, uh, you have this issue with writes, basically. Yeah, I mean, if you, partition, if you partition your banks nicely such that you can heat one of them without disturbing the others, sure, you can do that, right? But in today's systems, usually you don't have that sort of partitioning as much. 
but uh, but there's no fundamental reason why it cannot be done. I would say, <laughs> yes. Uh, the, yeah, uh, this is just a general question about PCM. Does the general heat of your system impact the reliability of PCM? Yeah. Again, uh, uh, we don't have good data on it, as far as I know. My guess is yes. Uh, if you're operating at very high temperatures, for example, you're more vulnerable to noise. Again, uh, in these devices. But again, we don't have any data to back that up fully. In DRAM, for example, we have very good data on how your temperature affects retention times, right? But we don't have such data, uh, empirical data on phase change memory. But the, in all likelihood, yes. Okay. No more questions? Okay, then have a good weekend. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's some one last one, quick one. Make it quick. <laughs> right. So uh, I guess in one of the earlier lectures we saw it's already hard to design memory controllers for DRAM. Mm -hmm. But this complexity will become, let's say, linear or exponential when you have multiple heterogeneous memories. Sure. Or, so is, is, is there any solution to that? Or people just assume that it will happen? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, there, you need to make things as less, uh, you need to make things as simple as possible, but no simpler than what you need, right? In this, part, in this case also. So whenever you have a heterogeneous system, your complexity will increase, I think, yes. I don't think there's a solution to that. If you want the benefits of the heterogeneous system, you need to pay the cost for the complexity. But hopefully try to be as simple as possible. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, have a good weekend. I will see you next week. Take care. Nope. Say it again. Oh, okay. Yes. Let's see. Let me first stop sharing so that I can see. Okay, sure. Yeah. See you next week.